This is Matt Brown, and you're listening to Just a Good Conversation. A boy from Connecticut became one of the hardest working men in photography. Not bad for a guy who wore a sweet cowboy hat and nudie boots for most of his life. Paul Kennedy became a photographer in a small town, and within five years, he was on top of the world in the photo industry. So he takes these five images and, he, and they print them and everything. And the show opens at a gallery in Bridgeport, Connecticut on a Friday night. And I go for the show opening and, you know, it's nice. It, it's cool. Um, people are looking at my photographs and I, I got some nice reactions and I'm feeling real good. So I go home, happy. On Sunday morning, the phone rings. It's my father-in-law. He says, have you bought the New York Times yet? I said, not yet. He said, well, you better buy it because your name's all over the front of the art section. So I go out and buy the Times. I actually buy several copies of the Times. And <laughs> the New York Times photography critic had reviewed this show. And basically, he said the show sucked, except for the work of one photographer. And he spent like five or six paragraphs talking about my pictures. I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to all of our archives. My guests have ranged from sports writers, a soldier who was awarded the Silver Star, and director of photography for the NFL, Ben Leidenberg. And I didn't realize how much I had missed it until I got on the field for the Super Bowl. This was my only game on the field, touching the grass. Pre-game warm-ups, it is me and one of the NFL film's cameramen. And Tom Brady's uh, starting to warm up and uh, throw the ball around. And he is whipping balls over our head to receivers. And we're just sitting on the ground. He's just, and that's when I realized, like, wow, I've definitely missed this. And, you know, it's Tom Brady, you know, up close, personal, throwing the football. Go to justagoodconversation.com for all our archives. Let's take a quick break for a sponsor before diving into my conversation with Paul Kennedy. I am so fortunate and lucky that you answered my email and you're sitting in front of me. Thank you, Paul. Well, it's my pleasure, frankly. Uh, I, and I thank you for asking me. Absolutely. You have been on my list like a, like a CIA assassin. I've wanted you. <laughs> and I, I, I loved your work. I saw it early as, as, as a kid. Um, you were on my wall of Sports Illustrated heroes, the images you were taking. And then when I met you at a lecture... Uh, I, the way the, the, first of all, your presence, when you walked in, I was like total badass <laughs> cowboy hat and boots. I was like, damn, all photographers should look like this legit. <laughs> you had a great look. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I have had that look for a long time. It works, man. Like you're like the Willie Nelson of the photos. Like you should just keep that look and let it roll. <laughs> well, as you know, I can. As you saw, I'm still wearing the cowboy hats. I love it. I love it. Where Where did you grow up? I grew up in Connecticut. Okay, so and you went to school there. So you've all families always been East Coast. Yep. How did you hide any kind of loss of R's or, I mean, you sound not like you're from Connecticut. I don't know. I, I think part of it is because I spent so much time traveling around, even before I was a photographer. Uh, I, I went to Africa for a year when I was 14. Uh, I traveled around this country extensively. Uh, I hitchhiked everywhere. So you, you skipped that New England loss of, of language and you came out okay. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> How was it growing up in Connecticut as a kid? Um, if it's three or four days a year, Connecticut's real nice. <laughs> all, all three or four, huh? Yeah, there's a couple of days in the spring when the flowers are blooming, you know, and this, the, the temperature is nice. And there's a couple of days in the fall when it's very colorful. And then in between, you know, from spring to fall, it's hot and humid and stormy. And in the winter, it sucks. <laughs> Well, that sounds like it must have been a great childhood. <laughs> I, I I spent a lot of time out of Connecticut, uh, but uh, I I mean Connecticut's not a bad place. My family still lives there. My okay. sister still lives there. Some of my family still lives there, and it's it's a great place. I just it wasn't my place. Right? Are you where are you at in your sibling line? Are I'm you, the oldest. So you're you're the big boy. Yeah, I'm the big boy. Yeah. How many siblings did you have? I have three younger sisters. Oh boy. So you really did run the troop. Yes. With three girls behind you, you really had to keep the boys away. Um, yeah, uh, but I was, um, my sisters had a hard time following in my footsteps. Okay. Uh, I was, um, 
nobody's parents would let me date their daughters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was kind of the bad guy in school. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. well. It, it worked with the outfit, with the hat and the <laughs> and the shoes and everything. Yeah, everybody likes a rough cowboy. Yeah, I, I was that. You were that. <laughs> when when did you discover art and the camera? That's a good question. Uh, I was a jock. I thought the reason for air was to inflate balls. I didn't care what kind of ball as long as there was a ball to play with. Um, I did not own a camera until I was 26 years old. What did you play? Uh, in high school, I was uh, I actually four sports. Uh, we didn't play football in my high school. We didn't have okay. it. So I was soccer, basketball, track, and baseball. Wait, you played soccer but not football? Yeah. I would have thought it was the other way around. In Connecticut, there's a lot of schools, or, or were a lot of schools, that played soccer because football was so expensive to oh, play. Oh, okay. All right. Was it a big school, big town you grew up in? No, very small town. Stores, Connecticut, which is the home in the University of Connecticut. Okay. But when I grew up there, now it's a medium-sized city. Uh, back then, I think the population when I was in high school was about 3,500 people. Wow. That's knowing everybody. Yeah. Whoa. So, because you, you went to Connecticut, right? You're a Husky. I went to Yukon, yeah. Was that, was that like, I'm just going to stay home and go there? No, it's where I got in. Okay. <laughs> Right. Uh -huh. They decided, you know, Paul, we'll, we'll let this kid in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got in a couple of places, but I, I, right. UConn, was, UConn was a good school. And my father was a professor at UConn. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'd grown up in the UConn family. Uh, so I just, I went there. It was natural. Yeah. Was there art around as it growing up in the house? Did mom or dad, anybody paint or play music or? No. Um, we had... My mother was, I think I got my art from my mother. My mother was, could, could walk into a room and redo it in an hour and you would be amazed at the results. Uh, really? Our walls had art on them, but they weren't produced by us. Okay. Uh, my parents did not, not appreciate art. They appreciated it, but they weren't part of They weren't the uh, creators of it, it, but they actually loved it being around. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. then- you said you didn't find your camera until 26? I bought the first camera I ever owned. I was a graduate student at UConn. I was uh, newly married. I. What did you study? Uh, I was actually getting a degree in public administration of recreational services, a master's degree. Okay. But my real intent was to go into politics. Wow. What? That's it. Okay. So how do you find the camera? One of my five part-time jobs was graduate assistant track coach. And a couple of kids on the team, this was the early 70s, and the Minolta SRT 101 explosion had, had occurred. And everybody was buying Minolta SRT 101s. And we had like five kids on the team bought them. Yeah. Uh, and I, they seemed to be having a good time. You know, okay. they would talk about the pictures they were making in the film and stuff like that. And right. I thought, well, man, let me, let me not give this a shot. So one Friday afternoon, completely on a whim, without any money. I mean, I'm a graduate student. My wife is working as a bank teller, making $3,000 a year. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, we got no money. And I went out and spent, as my wife put it, three and a half months rent. On a, on a camera and a, an extra lens and a flash. And I took my new camera to a track meet we had that weekend at the University of Vermont uh, with one roll of black and white film tracks. Sure. And I shot that roll. And on Monday morning, I walked into a newspaper office and found the photo editor and asked him to show me how to process the film. You just decided I'm going to walk up to this newspaper and ask them like there was no like maybe i should take it to a studio or a photo lab you just newspaper was your first guess yep that is ballsy that's what the photo editor thought too. <laughs> <laughs> he thought i was a tad on the brash side yeah because you're not a kid you're not 14 like yep. doing a paper route you're a grown man yep rolling in going hey you want to process this for me <laughs> well i wanted him to show me how sure. to process it so he, he did. He took me into the dark room. We went through all the steps. We reeled it on the on a, on a metal reel mm -hmm. and uh, souped it. And when it came out of the photo flow, he stripped his fingers down through it, which of course you're not supposed to do. Right, but, but he's a newspaper man, does. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a reason why he's a photo editor. Exactly. <laughs> And he holds the film up to light. And I'm sure he expected, I told him it was the first roll of film I'd ever shot. And so I'm sure he expected to find nothing on it. 
And he got about two thirds of the way down the roll and he picked up a loop and he put the loop on this one frame and he goes, Jesus Christ, I'll buy that one. And I was hooked. Really? Yes. Now, let's back up. You're at the track meet. Did you run track? Yes. Okay, so you had an understanding at least what the athletes do yep. per event and stuff. But what are you thinking photographically? Just kind of shoot it like from a bystander's point of view or from the athlete's point of view? Like what was your process with that first roll of film? I, it's hard to describe this. I don't know where this comes from, but it just turns out that I have an eye. I didn't know that. Right. Again, I was a jock. I, you know, art was not something other than what I saw hanging on. I had no real uh, desire or want to be an artist. Sure. But I knew what pleased my eye, and that's what I did. I just shot pictures that made me feel like, okay, well, that, that, that's kind of a nice photograph, maybe. Wow. Um, I thought everyone saw what I saw. Did you really? Oh, yeah. I didn't realize it. Yeah, you didn't realize it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I didn't realize that people didn't see the same things the same way I saw them. I just thought, you know, I, in fact, I, I didn't think the first several rolls of film I shot, I didn't think they were anything special at all because I figured everybody saw that. Right. Turns out, no, everybody didn't see that. What a curtain being pulled away and exposing the world to you. Oh, totally. And I mean... Instantly, I sold that photograph to that photo editor, and I within two weeks, I had I had made the, the camera I bought wasn't an SRT one hundred and one. It was a, a Fujika ST seven hundred and one screw mount match needle. I mean, as basic and inexpensive as you as I could afford to get in single lens reflex. Right. I mean, it was stop down metering. I you. The, Holy moly. Oh, yeah. I mean, totally basic. So immediately I knew this wasn't going to cut it. So I went back to the same camera store, traded in the brand new camera that I had bought for used Nikon. What Nikon? F. Okay. The old right. bam, the old bam, brick. kick it down the street. Right. Uh, Nikon F. Yeah, you can use it as a car jack, exactly. whatever. Exactly. Whatever. You can sit your car on it if yeah. you want. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you can swing that thing in a union event and get out of there if you had to. Yep, and totally. Wow. So I buy this. So he says to you, though, I want that one. What's what's your heart? What are you thinking? Like, what's that a first emotion for you? I'm about to quit graduate school. Is it really? That goes to your head like instantly. Like just you're absolutely addicted immediately to totally. whatever he just said. Totally. So you go home, you have a wife and you have to explain this. What's that conversation like? That conversation was like, what are you, crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, no. <laughs> My mother-in-law didn't speak to me for six months. She thought I was the dumbest man in the history of the world. I, and, and can you blame her a bit? Like, that's a crazy kind of notion. Yes. That you've gone to one high school track event. No, college. Or college. Yeah. Okay. And now you're, you're, you're switching your whole career yep. to something you just jumped into the deep end. Mm -hmm. Holy Christ. In two weeks, I bought not only that, tri that Nikon that I... I bought another Nikon F and two more lenses. So now I've got four lenses, two Nikons, a couple of, uh, one flash still. Uh, I didn't buy another flash for another few weeks. Um, I had business card printed that said Paul Kennedy photographer and quit graduate school. Two weeks. What is the guy at the camera store thinking? Um, <laughs> the guys, <laughs> they were. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to be thinking, this guy's crazy, but I love him. He keeps buying our stuff. Um, this guy's crazy is kind of a re recurring theme in my life. Is, it, so. is that on the back side of the business card? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something Paul like Kennedy. that. Yeah. This guy's friend. crazy. This guy's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So what are those first like 90 days like? What's your process? The first 90 days were difficult because no one knew me as a photographer. Everybody knew me as, you know, Paul Kennedy. Uh, not right. The, not the guy we want our daughter to date. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the other business card, the old one. There you go. Um, so it was, of course, I'm a little older by this. I'm 26, so I'm a little bit more socially acceptable, I guess. Right. And, and I'm married, so I'm not yeah. really a danger to anyone. And I'm just struggling to find a way to turn the cameras into income. So that first 90 days was all about figuring out how to make some money. Wow. 
So what, what, what do you think? What, where do you go? Is well, your knowledge of the photo industry at this point zero? Zero, yeah. I'm, I bought John Hedgeco's book, um, which I, Essentials of Photography or something like that. I forget mm-hmm. the title now. Um, but, and I read it cover to cover. So that gave me at least some technical knowledge okay. that I didn't have. Right, because you're, you're still unaware of how shutter speeds and aperture and all that kind of stuff, film stock, like, you're new. I'm, I'm so new, I'm not even unwrapped yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I, I'm amazed you, at that track meet, shot the proper shutter speed or, you know, aperture. Like, you just didn't, like, goof it up and, like, ah, oh, it's 30 of a second, right? No, I, I, the shot that he bought was a shot of four hurdlers going over a flight of hurdles. And it was about the third hurdle and they were all dead even. They were all lead right. leg, Le- straight lead. out, yep. you know, bent uh, trail leg, bent over the hurdle, arms, everything, it, all, almost in unison. And of course, that is what caught his eye. Sure. And the fact that it was sharp and in focus. <laughs> that's a plus. <laughs> it was a plus. That, yeah. That's almost a guarantee to get in the newspaper back then. Yeah. Yeah, pretty Sharp. much. Sharp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you read the book. What's your step after that? Um, there was a, a nearby town, Manchester, Connecticut. Uh, somebody had started a weekly newspaper. And so I, I went and applied for a job as a photographer. Um, and I, I mean, it was freelance kind of thing. You right. Know, I paid, I think he was paying me $10 a picture that he used. Okay. So that meant I had to make pictures that he would use. Right. So immediately I'm thinking about how to make good photographs. You know, how do you make a photograph that somebody is going to go, yeah, I, I want that. And how do you make that at some, you know, ladies knitting club meeting that he sends you to photograph, that kind of thing. Right. So I began immediately figuring out ways to view uh, a scene that weren't necessarily ways that everybody saw every day. Wow. That is so bright to be thinking that way so early in your career. I do you think it's the maturity like you're 26 and you're not 16? No, I was 26 going on 14. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a great podcast. <laughs> this is fantastic. So, I mean, so what was it? What was what were you trying to see differently then? How were you maneuvering yourself and the camera and the lens and the subject? I I loved photography or I loved pictures. I loved uh, I, Life magazine. I used to haunt the mailbox waiting for Life to arrive because my parents subscribed to okay, Life. Good. Life and Time. Um, that was almost man- man- mandatory, right? Almost back then. Yeah. yeah. If you had any kind of you know anything going on upstairs at all, you were you know yeah, getting you got those two magazines exactly. So I would haunt the mailbox waiting for Life, and I'm, I'm leafing through seeing phenomenal photographs and seeing how the life photographers uh, and that that stuck in my head and so when i began taking photographs myself and especially you know photographs that i wanted to get printed and paid for i began pulling those things out of my head how did they do this how did you know what where did they go with this picture and it worked out you were able to emulate at least yeah. something of they what they were doing exactly wow and, and I mean, it's a weekly magazine and or weekly newspaper. Um, you weren't going to get wealthy doing it. But a friend of mine at the camera store, um, I had made friends with a bunch of people yeah. at the camera store. Yeah, they know you by now. Yeah, they know. Hey, Paul. Uh, I was almost at, it was a 30 mile trip to that store and I was there almost daily. <laughs> Wow. Oh, yeah. I was haunting that place because they would talk to me. It was a big store. It was the biggest store in Connecticut at the time. And they would talk. There were lots of guys there, lots of accumulated knowledge because most of them were photo junkies. They'd been taking pictures since they were six or seven, you know. Right. And uh, so they had knowledge that I didn't have. And they were willing to part it with you. Yeah, you- they were willing to talk to me about things. So we talked. And then I would take what I gleaned from them. So on one of these trips to the camera store, one of the guys says, uh, you know, you're making any money? I said, not much. And he said, well, you know, if you go to Loring's, they use freelance photographers to do this, the action shots at high schools. Loring's, Loring Laboratories was a, a photo lab or photo, photo company that pretty much owned the high schools in Connecticut. Okay. Um, I think there were a hundred and... 
70 odd high schools in Connecticut at the time, and Loring's probably had a hundred of them at least. Wow. For senior heads and, you know, the whole yearbook thing. Okay. So I went to Loring's uh, again, <laughs> walked in, you know, <laughs> and, and I find the guy who's in charge of the photography department. And I say, you know, I hear you hire people and I, I'd like to get hired. I'd like to do some of that work. He says, have you ever shot hockey? Of course, I had never shot hockey at that point, And I said, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he said, OK, there's a hockey game tonight at, at the Bolton Ice Palace. Um, uh, I want you to shoot it. So I, I went to the Bolton Ice out at Palace, and who's there but the same guy that I had just talked to, because he's not going to rely on me getting right. the photographs. So he's there shooting as well. I'm shooting with a Kawa 66, two and a quarter square, and my Nikons. <laughs> okay? <laughs> By that time, I'd added a Kawa 66 to my repertoire. And... At the end of the night, I give him my film, and he says, call me in the morning, and, or call me in the afternoon, and, and I'll let you know how you did. So I call him up, and he says, I sent 40 photographs to the school. 38 of them were yours. Wow. Yeah. Well, what were you thinking? I thought, I, I maybe have a shot at this. That must have been an absolute just unbelievable moment to figure out like you're, you're you hit a home run yeah i mean you hadn't shot the sport you knew the sport right yeah but you hadn't shot it no. you go in with what that gear you have not the latest greatest state of the art and you crush it yeah what were you again this goes back to kind of the track what were you looking and trying to achieve that just worked I had watched a lot of hockey on television, okay. obviously, never having shot it, but nonetheless, I'd watched it on TV. So I knew, you know, how hockey worked. Hockey is tough to shoot. It's, oh, it's brutal. Especially a high school hockey game in a, a place where the light is somewhere between the black hole of Calcutta and the dark side of the dark, moon. Dark side of the moon. Yeah, there like, you go. I can only imagine looking at it, it must have been very gray. Uh, gray would be. Enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Great would have been a step up. <laughs> so, okay, boom. Uh, that happens. What's next? I mean, you're... Well, what's next is this company, uh, if you were a good shooter, you might get two or three jobs a week. Um, uh, you know, at whatever high school. Probably at a high school in your immediate area or the high schools in your immediate area. Within two weeks, I was doing... 30 jobs a week, um, and they were sending me all over the state. And there were schools that were saying, uh, we don't want anybody back but him. They were requesting for Paul. Yeah. Bring PK with us. We, get, we, got, we want his stuff. We like his stuff. I, they sent me to do a shoot at the biggest high school in Connecticut at the time. And they had a new yearbook advisor. It was a 20-something woman. Um, and she was picky, difficult. And they told me up front, you know, do the best you can because she's hard. <laughs> she got the photographs that I had done and she called them right up and said, don't ever send to me anyone else. That's the only guy I want from now on. Why? I was making pictures that they weren't getting from anybody else. So let's, let's reverse engineer. What were the other guys doing poorly or wrong? And then you're standing out doing what Paul's doing. What were they doing? Well, a lot of them were using on-camera flash because okay. that's easy. Right. And I wasn't. Um, I didn't like on-camera flash. I thought on-camera flash flattened the images. It made people look weird. His shadows were too harsh. Yeah, that str extremely hard shadow coming from it. It's exactly. So I was mostly shooting available light uh, and trying and using the light. And I mean, I, I would see some of the guys come back with pictures where, you know, they backlit shots and they hadn't opened up for it. They hadn't done anything that would help the image. I mean, sometimes they were just like black holes. You know, right. People's faces were no so, eyes, even though they were shooting flashes. Oh, my goodness. It, it, it just, it's hard to describe. There were so many errors. It was... It would, they weren't making a lot of money, so they were thinking, you know, I'm going to give them what they're paying me for. Right. And 
I wasn't thinking that way at all. I was thinking I want the best shot that I can produce. I don't care what they're paying me. Uh, they're, they're paying me, so they, they get 100% of what I can give them. And it was paying off. How quickly then were you starting to understand you know, the camera and shutter aperture? Those things, are, oh, yeah. this, oh, yeah. they're, they're starting to come together oh, and click. Big time, big time. Yeah, yeah. you oh, picked up on it. I, I'm that way about everything. Uh, is, I read Hedgeco's book cover to cover, then I read it cover to cover again. Uh, I was reading magazines, uh, anything that I could get my hands on that delved into what it took to make a good photograph. I was reading it, and then I was trying to emulate it. There were days when I would go out and shoot all day long, just on my own. I'd just give myself assignments and go somewhere and shoot something, and then I'd spend, I built a dark room in my basement. We had a, a rented condo, a, a townhouse condo, that right. had a basement, you know, because in Connecticut they have basements. Sure. So I built a dark room in my basement. I mean, serious dark room. Now, how's hey. that conversation? Honey, I'm building a dark room. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I mean, at this point, is she kind of getting it? Oh, totally. I mean, this was our second house, our first house where, where I bought the camera. I had turned first the kitchen into a dark room, <laughs> and then I turned the second bedroom into a dark room because she was a little irritated about the kitchen being yeah, a dark room. I can understand. Because, <laughs> I mean, you, I had to black out the windows. <laughs> and <laughs> It was kind of extreme. You should have thought that one through a little bit. Yeah, but, probably. Okay. But, you know, there was running water, so I'm going right. to, okay, let's go where the running water is. Uh, and, and then I turned the bedroom into a dark room, and I put big bins of water and small electric pumps to pump into the oh sink. My goodness. Oh, yeah. I was... Ingenuity. I, I, in for a penny, in for a pound. Totally. Wow. I mean, the, the dark room sink, I built a plywood dark room sink that was eight feet long and two and a half feet wide and 14 inches deep. Jesus. Yeah. So you got this thing in the basement, you're all in. Oh, totally. I even, I you're making off. money. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to make money, and I'm starting to get some decent assignments. I'm starting to get assignments from Business Week, from Newsweek, from Sport Magazine. Now, are you reaching out to them? I reached out to Sport. Business Week called me out of the blue. Now, when you reach out to Sport, how long into your career are you? About three years, I think. Okay, so you're at least three years in. So you got some battle scars under you by now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you reach out to them. Yeah. I Sport and then Business Week called me out of the blue. Newsweek called me out of the blue. Um, and then... New York Times, uh, I got a couple of assignments from them. Now, what were those kind of assignments? Oh, you know, it's all the basic news stuff. I, I, I started shooting for the Associated Press. That was where some of this came from. Okay. They would see images that I had made for the AP. Across the wire, right. And, and I, I caught a couple of lucky breaks. Um, we had a tornado in Connecticut. Tornadoes are rare in Connecticut. Very rare, right? Very rare. I was shooting a, a soccer game at UConn. And my beeper goes off, and it's the head of the bureau at the AP. Paul, I need you to go to Windsor Locks. There's a tornado, uh, et cetera. The staff photographer was on vacation at that time. Uh -oh. So I'm the only guy they've got. So it's in Windsor Locks at the airport. The, it, it had hit the airport, and the state police had shut Windsor Locks down. You, there, were, there were no access roads into Windsor Locks. They roadblocked them all. Wow. So, and he knew this, uh, and he told me, you may, you may not get in, but, you know, do what you can. Right. Well, I'd been around the block a couple of times, and I knew that there was a river that wasn't very deep that I could cut across in my car and come up through a tobacco field on the other side and access the airport. <laughs> so that's what I did. <laughs> I got around the state police roadblocks. Oh. So I get to the airport, and the main set, the terminal side of the airport had not been hit at all. But the far side of the airport, where the Air Museum was and the Air National Guard was, that had been devastated. Really? And the Air Just... Museum had been torn up. And Connecticut's Air Museum at the airport had, was well known. It was a very good Air Museum. Devastated. I shot the crap out of that. Then I see the governor's helicopter come in. Governor at the time was uh, a woman. Uh, I'll think of her name in a minute. And 
she lands and I walk right over the helicopter and I said, Governor, I, I really need to, to get some aerial shots of this scene. Uh, can I borrow your helicopter? <laughs> This woman lands for a major disaster, and you're bumming the ride for her. From well, her. she was going to go up and look, so sure. she took me along, and I shot. Now, do you have a credential or a vet? Do you have anything that says, like, I'm legit, man? Her name was Ella Grasso. Okay. And she had seen me at various state functions okay. shooting for the Associated Press, so I wasn't an unknown quantity. Okay. She kind of recognized me. And so it wasn't like, okay, out of the blue, this weird guy comes yeah. up with a bunch of cameras and says, can I ride in your helicopter? She sort of knew who I was. There was at least some recognition. So she took me up. Meantime, Associate, or um, it was then UPI was the other big. Reuters really didn't exist, uh, at least functionally for us. Right. And all the newspapers, the Hartford Current, all the Springfield papers, hell, the New York Times, and all those guys were stuck at a roadblock. Right. They're nowhere near. They aren't getting anything. And I'm in the governor's helicopter. I get out of the helicopter. I find a payphone. I call in and I tell the AP bureau chief that I've got some decent stuff. He says, bring it in now. And, of course, we just killed it. We just killed it. Our pictures, AP pictures ran everywhere. Wow. Yeah. Now, it's a little bit of dumb luck that you even had a lot of film. Like, you could have been one of those things where you're like, on your last roll. I never went anywhere without about 100 rolls of film. Good Lord, even then? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Oh. oh, yeah. Wow. So you crushed it. Yeah. So does that then just elevate next not notch? Like, Paul's a, a guy we can go to? Well, for the AP, yeah. Uh, by that time, you know, stringers for the AP, a bureau might have five or six stringers. Mm -hmm. By that time, I was the only stringer they used. That was it. They called me for everything. They didn't like paying the staffer to overtime to do the hockey games, the Whaler hockey games. Sure, right. So they gave me a contract to shoot the Whaler hockey games. Well, that was like gold, not because they paid me so much, but because everybody saw my hockey pictures and they loved them. Right. I mean, that's 41 days, you know, of work. Tons of work plus tons of exposure. Right. You can't pay for that. That's great. Yeah. They were getting notes from newspaper editors thanking them for the fabulous photograph. What year is this? That was 1977, 78, 79. So how much exposure was hockey getting like in newspapers? Was it pretty... F well, in Canada, it was getting great exposure. Edmonton, and Calgary, yeah, that's big. Yeah. So your images are being seen and they're top notch. Yeah, they're loving them. A different look than what other people are, do are doing? A different look and just better action. Uh, I mean, again... I don't know why I saw what I saw. Uh, I don't know why that's here, but right. it was clearly something different because people were responding to it. it the AP had a, um, a commercial division, uh, Wide World Photos. Mm -hmm. um, Wide World Photos paid crap, um, but, you know, it was a commercial shoot. And I got a... Sh Bob Child, the staffer, gave me a Wide World Photo shoot, and... It was it was for the first computer diagnostic machine for a gas station. So first car diagnostic computer in, in Bristol, Connecticut, this gas station in Bristol, Connecticut. Of and I places. go and shoot it. Now, everybody else who shot for Wide World at that point, you know, they stuck an on-camera flash in that car, camera. They shot a roll, maybe two, shipped it off to New York, forgot about it, took their 10 bucks and went home. And plus 15 cents a mile, I think they paid. <laughs> yeah. I strobe lit it with studio strobes. I had a set of Speedatron brown boxes. Now, where'd you get those? <laughs> I bought them from a studio in Virginia that a friend of mine had taken over, and this stuff was old, and he wanted to get rid of it. And he called me up, and he said, uh, for 50 bucks, you can have it all. He shipped it to me. So you get these bricks. Bricks. They were bricks. I mean, one of them, did, one of the power packs didn't even work. A couple of the heads were, I had to completely rebuild to make them work. Uh, but now I got strokes. Right. And that's a lot different look. A whole different ballgame. Yeah, because now I'm bouncing lights off ceilings. I'm putting umbrellas in. You know, I'm, I'm doing stuff that uh, 
that no one else is doing for Wild World Photo. Right. I mean, they got these photographs, and, and Bob told me, the guy from Wild World called up and said, who the hell is this guy? Right. Who's this son of a bitch? Jesus, yeah. this is a Life magazine, right? Because that's all of a sudden what you've done. You've elevated your look. Then I got another Wild World photo. <laughs> So Wesleyan University finds a mummy in the attic of the library. What? <laughs> Back in 18-something, 1890-something, one of their professors goes to Egypt and ships a mummy back to Wesleyan. And one way or another, it ends up in the attic, and somebody rooting around in the attic one day finds a body in the attic of the Wesleyan library. So Holy doesn't, doesn't take them too long to figure out it's a mummy, right? But now they x-ray it at, at Middletown High School, or Middletown Hospital, I should say, and they see four tubes in its abdomen. It's, of course, it's still all wrapped up. So now they're really curious, and they set up <laughs> this, we're going to cut open this mummy and see what these things are. And a a wide world photo sends me to shoot this. Well, I'm thinking, this is an opportunity. So by now, I've, I've up from Speedatron brown, brown boxes to Norman P2000Ds, and I bring four Norman P2000Ds to this classroom in Wesleyan, in the science building, and I get there four hours early, and I set up the whole room with strokes. Life comes, look comes, New York Times comes, they're all on camera flash. I'm Norman P2000D's 12,000 watt second, or excuse me, 8,000 watt seconds worth of light. Wow. Umbrellas, the whole nine yards. The photographs were awesome. Sure. You're you're low ISO, you're I'm shooting it, it, ISO 64. Right. Aperture, you know, whatever you want. I mean, yep. that stuff's got to be beautiful it compared was, to them. It was absolutely gorgeous. And so, boom, and, another one. And my world was blown away. Jesus. So now my name is starting to get out. Right. This guy's got lights. He knows what he's doing. Were you practicing with those lights as much as you can so you can figure out light and understand it and what it shapes and does and modifiers? Yes. I was using light modifiers. I was, I was doing everything I possibly could. I could, if I would read something in a magazine and I would go try it. Right. They did what? I'm going to try that. Exactly. I, when I bought the Norman P2000Ds, the first thing I did was go to Yukon's field house. Now, in those days, Yukon's field house was like a Quonset hut. So setting up lights was kind of difficult because you had this high center, but you had low ends. Right. So I had to figure out how to effectively light this place with four power packs, and I had eight heads, so I'm using two heads per. Because the Norman P2000Ds had a, a duration time of two fortieth of a second, which you can't stop action with. No. So if you only have one head, but if you have two heads, now it's four hundred and eightieth of a second. Now you can. Now you can stop action. So I two-headed everything. I spent an entire weekend figuring out how to phase the power packs together, how to sync them together, how to do all of that. Blew up one of the power packs because I had it out of sync. Had to send it back to Norman and get it rebuilt. Oh, my God. But I learned. I, by the end of that weekend, I knew how to rig strokes. So at this point, I'm thinking, Sports Illustrated. Hmm. Are you really thinking? I'm thinking about it, yeah. So... There's a photo competition in Connecticut. Guy at the camera store tells me about it. <laughs> okay. And it's an art competition. Art photos. And he says, you're not exactly an art photo. He said, but here's the, the name of the guy who's uh, curating your thing. Kevin McCall. See, maybe he'll see you. So I call him and, and he says, yeah, bring your stuff in. I'll take a look. So he goes through my slides. It's all slides. And he says, well, yeah, uh, I, I think we can work with this. I said, you mean, you know, there's something here you use? He said, oh, yeah, <laughs> there's something here I use. He said, I want these five photographs. So he takes these five images, and, he, and they print them and everything, and the show opens at a gallery in Bridgeport, Connecticut, on a Friday night, and I go for the show opening, and, you know, it's nice. It, it's cool. Um, people are looking at my photographs, and I, I got some nice reactions, and I'm feeling real good. So I go home, happy. On Sunday morning, the phone rings. It's my father-in-law. 
He says, have you bought the New York Times yet? I said, not yet. He said, well, you better buy it because your name's all over the front of the art section. So I go out and buy the Times. Actually, I buy several copies of the Times. And <laughs> the New York Times photography critic had reviewed this show. And basically, he said the show sucked, except for the work of one photographer. And he spent like five or six paragraphs talking about my pictures. Wow. On Monday, the curator of the show called me. And he says, you need to take your work to Sports Illustrated. I said, I might be a little early on that. And he says, no. He said, when the New York Times writes stories about you, take your name to take your stuff to Sports Illustrated. So I put together a, a tray of 58 slides. And I went down to New York. In my typical fashion, you know, walk in, right? Right. <laughs> of course. Only you can't walk into the Time Life building. I get as far as the elevator and... One of the guards stops me. He says, where's your pass? I got no pass. I got no <laughs> name tag. I got nothing but a box of slides. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm Paul. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this has worked before. <laughs> yeah. So he says, no, no, no. You got to go to that office over there in the corner and see if you can get in. But he says, but you can't go upstairs unless you have an appointment and a pass. So, of course, I go to the office and, of course, they're like, forget it, boy. Yeah. <laughs> You're out of here. So I go out onto the, the plaza of the Time Life building trying to figure out what to do next. And I think, you know, it's almost noon. I'll bet they're changing the guards on the elevator. And sure enough, when they changed the guards on the elevator, I ran in and I told the guard I had filmed for Time Magazine. They were waiting for it upstairs. Because it's Friday and time's on deadline on Friday. Absolutely. So he, th this isn't the first time he's heard this. So he says, all right, go ahead. I'm now, up, I'm now on the elevator headed for the 20th floor where Sports Illustrated is. I get off of the 20th and find the picture editor's office. John Dominus was the picture editor at the time, and he had a secretary named Gloria. Gloria was sitting at her desk when I walked in. And I, you know, I said, hi, my name is Paul Kennedy, and I, I'd, I'd like to show my portfolio. Gloria could teach truck drivers how to swear, <laughs> and she used her entire vocabulary on me. How did you get up here? You... <laughs> And I mean, Gloria was not, Gloria was, had a voice. Right. She could be heard. <laughs> she could be heard. One of the deputy picture editors came out of his office and he says, down, Gloria, down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll deal with this. He says, you got, what do you got? I handed him my tray and he says, okay, sit down next to Gloria there and I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> and he takes my tray into what I later learned was a projection room. And he's in there two minutes and he comes out. And I thought, okay, this was short. But he walked past me and he got another picture editor. And about 10 minutes later, they came out and they said, we really like your stuff. We'd like to keep your book and show it to John Dominus. Is that okay with you? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you think I came for, dude? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I'm like eight feet off the ground at that point. I mean, yeah, what, what's that emotion like for you at that moment? Oh, I mean. Gloria was about ready to eat your head off. Yes. Now someone wants to show your work to the, the guy who can really make things happen. For totally, you. totally. I'm like I'm I'm in another world. Uh, are, are are you even cognizant? Like outer body? Like are you breathing? Are, are you I'm wet yourself? Like, I'm, you've but got I'm pretty it. much out of body. Yeah, I'm like wow. I mean, things have been going really well all, for a couple of years now. I mean, I'm getting work. I'm, I'm making enough money to pay the rent, and you know. Right. You're I know equipment. I'm, I'm comfortable. But this is another realm. If I get work from Sports Illustrated, that's, a, that's potentially another realm. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm driving home. It's a two and a half hour ride home. And I don't think the wheels of the car touch the ground. And, and, and you can't make a phone call. And like, no, on the way no home, thing. right, and call honey and be like, sweet, no. you'll never believe this. <laughs> no. So no. it's just you for two and a half hours just in this car. And I still don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what Dominus is going to do. But it, but your your foot is so far in the door at this point. Exactly. Even if he said, you know, I like it, come back in six months. And that's pretty much what I'm expecting. I'm expecting to hear something like, you know, really like what you're doing. Why don't you shoot some more stuff and bring bring us to us in, in, a, in a couple of months. Saturday, the phone rings. It's Gloria. Dominus wants to see you here in New York tomorrow. Can you be here? He wants to see you on Sunday? New York, SI works on Sunday. I know, but 
that's an important day. Mm-hmm. That's a real work day. Exactly. That's a work day. That's deadline day. Yeah. So yeah, of course, of course, I I can be there. I mean, if I have to crawl there, I'm going to be there. Right. So I'm di- out front, Gloria. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this time when I get there, they give me a pass. And <laughs> That's sweet. You don't have to go through the back alley and get exactly. in. Exactly. So well, hold on. What's the conversation again with the wife when you get home? Like, honey, you'll never believe. Well, it, it was kind of that, uh, honey. You'll never believe it, but um, I, you know they they liked my work, and who knows where it's going to go? Of course, she's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> Does she understand the gravity of like what that meant? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there were a lot of other things that we had uh, two babies at the time. Uh, right. So, you know, things are, and one of them was extremely ill. So we were. There, there were other things in our head as well. Okay. Um, so you go in that Sunday. What's happening now? I go in and meet with Dominus. And Dominus was very quiet. Dominus was a Life magazine photographer. Great photographer in his own right. But very... I mean, you could sit in a room with Dominus for an hour and he might say 10 words. Um, and he, he looks, he says, uh, like your pictures. Whose strokes were those? I said, they're mine. You have your own strokes? Yes. Hmm. Do you travel with them? Yes. Hmm. I think we might use you. End of conversation. I drive two and a half hours for 10 minutes. <laughs> Maybe 10 minutes. Right. 20 so I, words, 10 minutes. I mean, it's just, wow. We couldn't have done that on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Right. But he wanted to size you up. He wanted to see. Yeah, he wanted to see me. He wanted to talk to me. So I go back home, another two and a half hour ride, and now it's Monday and Monday afternoon. I'm, I'm in Hartford at a friend of mine's studio, helping him out with a project that he's working on. And my beeper goes off and it's my wife. She said, you just had a call from a guy at Sports Illustrated. Here's his name and number, call him back right now. So I call him back and it's Dom Delaquani, who was yeah. Dominus's assistant. He says, um, are you available for a shoot this weekend? I said, yes. He said, okay, we would like you to shoot the opening or the, uh, yeah, the opening game of the, uh, at St. John's University. Uh, it was the opening basketball class. In those days, it was the Louis, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the classic now. Uh, it'll come to me. But Louis Carnesecca was the head coach at the oh, time. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and that tournament, that four-team tournament, was the opening tournament of the college basketball season. And it was and a those big days, one. Yeah, it was a big deal because St. John's was a major player. Major. Yeah. Joe Lapchick tournament. Right. So, I, of course, I say yes. Um, it's a black and white job. It's a column story. They're not going to give you anything big for your first job. So they're going to run one picture. Black and white, I'm shooting. Not even shooting color. I'm shooting black and white. So I go down and I rig remote cameras on both baskets. Uh, I, I do it as brown as I can do it. I mean, I'm trying to make it like I know what the hell I'm doing. Now, how much remote work have you done at this point? Uh, Enough? A lot? No. <laughs> First time. Jesus. I went to the camera store and bought it. <laughs> Here he goes, back to the camera store. Oh, they love you. Oh, yeah, they love me, <laughs> big time. <laughs> So you go, you get your gear? I get my gear. I go down there. I set it all up. I'm shooting two guys. St. John's had recruited uh, one of the top freshmen in the country, and they had recruited a, a, ju- a JUCO transfer that everybody wanted. So those were the two guys. That's what the story was, those two guys. And that's all I'm supposed to shoot. In the first half, it, it looked like these two guys had never played basketball in their lives. They stunk up the court. It was disgusting. They couldn't play worth a damn. And I'm thinking, here I get my break with Sports Illustrated, and these two guys are going to screw it up on me. Right. So it, at halftime, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to save this. <laughs> and in the first half, the one thing that was constantly noticeable was Louis Carnesecca storming up and down the sidelines. You know, this little five, six, five foot six inch Italian guy who was just, I mean, he spoke with his hands and he spoke volumes with right. his hands. Like Mussolini. He's yeah, just, I mean, no, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Scream at the refs, yell at players. 
So in the second half, whenever the two guys that I was supposed to shoot weren't either weren't on the court or were generally screwing up, I shot pictures of Carnesecca storming up and down the court and being Louis Carnesecca. Game ends. I, I drive down into the city, uh, drop my film off at the Time Life uh, building. I, I stay in the city for the, at that night. First thing in the morning, as soon as I think it's reasonable, I call Don Delaclani. He answers the phone and he doesn't even say hello. He says, why did you shoot Louis Carnesecca? I said, Don the, the, Don, the two guys you gave me to shoot stunk up the court all night. He says, I know I was at the game. I watched you shoot. He, <laughs> he's a big St. John's fan. Right, but he's watching you. Yeah. He says, um, Curry Kirkpatrick, who was the top basketball writer in the country at the time, he thought they screwed up all night long, too. So he did a story on Louis Carnesecca. He said, I came in this morning and got Curry's story and immediately got on the phone to everybody in the city trying to find pictures of Louis Carnesecca because we didn't tell you to shoot Carnesecca. And then your film came down. And all those pictures of Carnesecca were awesome. And by the way, you would never know that the two guys we gave you to shoot screwed up all night long because you got nothing but great stuff of them. You're going to get more work. Wow. Yeah. What was your thought? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I was thinking. I was so, um, I was in another realm at that point. Did you just hang up and tear up the room like the who? Just like, oh my God. I, uh, I hung up and, of course, I'm, I'm in my sister-in-law's apartment in New York, so I can't go too crazy. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, but I, you know, clearly... Things were moving in a direction that I wanted them to move in. But you don't know, you know, what's going to happen. And for a couple of weeks, I didn't get any work. And then they sent me out to Ohio State to do a shoot on the Ohio State basketball team. And it, they expected me to shoot available light because they didn't send me with an assistant, a, a staff assistant right. with strobes. Not knowing that they didn't expect me to shoot uh, uh, strobes, I shot strobes. I brought my own. You brought your own, did it yourself. Yeah. I set the whole rig up. Um, I mean, the folks at Ohio State, I'm sure, were wondering what was going on because I was, I was here for a, a, all day from the first moment they would let me in the building. I'm, I'm rigging in the catwalk. I'm rigging lights in the... In the uh, yeah, running zip line and everything. You, I mean, it was... <laughs> and I'm doing it all alone. Sure. And then I shoot the game, and at the end of the game, I got to take it all down. Pack it <laughs> back up. Back it up and, and yeah. fly back to Connecticut. So Dominus calls me on Sunday and says, because of course I shipped the film back to New York. Black and white or color? Color. Oh, so now we're oh, yeah. stepping up now. Exactly. Dominus, Bigger expectations immediately. Immediately. Dominus calls me from New York and says, whose strobes did you use? Did you use our strobes? Did you bring our one? I said, no, John, I brought my own strobes. Oh, nice job. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so he starts off pissed because he thought I, I used one of the assistants right. and incurred a whole bunch of expenses. And uh, uh oh. no, I shot my own strobes. Now he's happy. You know? Right. Now he's happy because he's got these great pictures. <laughs> all strobe lit. Immediately you're his buddy. I'm just like that again. Yeah. So all of a sudden I start getting work. And I started getting a lot of work. Um, I, I did a shoot for Sport Magazine at the America's Cup. Okay. So it's not the America's Cup. It's way, way early. We're like April. Uh, and boats are arriving. Crews are starting to do testing and whatnot. And they sent me up to do a picture of, of Ted. Now, Ted had won the Cup in 77. Now it's 80. He's bringing back the same boat, basically the same crew, roughly the same crew. And Sport wants to do a feature story on him. So I'm supposed to go up and... and Meet him that afternoon, shoot a portrait, a couple of shots, shots around the boat, and get out of there. Well, I get there, and <laughs> Ted's out with his wife. He'll be back shortly. Shortly turns into 11.30 that night, stone drunk, totally wasted. And his wife, who was prior to Jane, was even more wasted. <laughs> Jesus. Now, I've called the picture editor and told him, you know, what's going on. And he says, okay, get a room, spend the night, try and see him in the morning. 
Well, I wait for him, for Ted to show up. And when he finally shows up, I help him bring his wife up the stairs and I introduce myself, tell him, you know, what's going on, yada, yada, yada. He's so blasted, uh, I don't oh, know man. if he's remembering any of it. But he tells me to meet him at the boat in the morning. So 7 a.m., I'm at the boat on Bannister's Wharf. And he says, I tell him, I, you know, I just need a couple of shots. Can't, will you give me time, man? So I, he says, go ahead. And I, start, I, I shoot off several rolls of film. And then he turns to me and says, you want to come out on the boat? And he didn't mean the, the, uh, the America's Cup boat. He meant Fire 3, the tender. I said, yes. Of course, that's not my assignment. And I know I'm not going to get paid for this by sport, but I don't care. Here's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. You, that's always you, a yes. That's an absolute yes. So I spend the day on Fire 3 uh, shooting as, you know, they're out practicing all day long. Right. I know I've got some good stuff. Of course, it's not sports. I, I save sport their stuff. But the rest of this stuff, I get processed and I send down to Sports Illustrated to show them what I've been doing. Right. I get an assignment to shoot a feature story along with Eric Schweikart, who's the lead photographer on it, of Newport, Rhode Island in an America's Cup summer. Eric's a little upset because he thought he had this assignment all to himself, and he would have had it all to himself, except I get added to it. Right. But Eric's been shooting for Sports Illustrated forever. You know, he's a great shooter. Mm -hmm. So he's not worried about me. I end up getting the double truck opener and three of the five photographs that run in the... Oh! And from that point on, I was working weekly. Every week I had an assignment. That's it. That's all it took. They sent me to shoot the U.S. windsurfing championships at Old Silver Beach in, on Cape Cod. Column story, black and white, one picture. Because I get there and here's all these kids in girls in bikinis, buff guys, right. sailboats, color. Beautiful sky, the gorgeous water, sky. everything's color, pinks and yellows. And I call up Dominus, I said, Do John, you should keep me here for the week. This is an amazing shoot. I mean, there's so much going on. And the writer is there and he's going, yeah, yeah, call Dominus, see if we can't push this. It's just a column story right now. What, now, what was their thought thinking just to call him, it's going to be small? Like that, in my head immediately, I think it's going to be gorgeous color. The windsurfing championships. I, I know, but you know, you, you put talent down there, they can make a photo. But and I'm guessing that happened. I spend the week. <laughs> the cover for that week was supposed to be the Baltimore Orioles. They had a four-game set with the New York Yankees. Okay. Yankees win the first two games. The Yankees win game three. Cover's gone. Now they got to hunt for another cover. Well, it turns out everything else has fallen through. And by Saturday afternoon, there's two covers. And they've already done a chromalin of two covers. One is a Baltimore, the other is windsurfing. Windsurfing on the cover of Sports Illustrated. So windsurfing has gone from a one-picture black-and-white column story to at least cover consideration. Well, Baltimore wins game two, or game three, and a trailing in the bottom of the ninth, Baltimore comes back and beats the Yankees. So they get the cover. But windsurfing moves from one picture black and white column story to second lead, five pages, big photographs, all color. I'm like a hero. How's your confidence at this point? I, I'm measuring it in buckets. Just oozing. I'm killing it. Are you just now, this goes back to the I thing, like, are you just seeing things and you're just wondering, like, how is nobody else seeing this? Like, um, um, I'm working on a different level? I'm still at that point not really understanding why everybody doesn't see this. I, I really, I, that's, and I'm not blowing right. smoke here. Right, no. I just didn't understand that I had an eye that not everybody has. Right. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah, it is. When you go to an event and you see something and everybody's over there and you're like, you're missing it. Mm-hmm. This light, the shaft, the colors. Exactly. Hello. All of that. 
This composition's perfect. What and, are you doing? And that's what I was doing in my head all the time, thinking it was normal, you know, that everybody yeah. did this. But turns out not everybody did. <laughs> There's only a few of us. Yeah. I mean, so now, once a week, you're just I'm going out there. places left and right. Uh-huh. And then corporations start calling me. Right, because your name's out at this yeah. point. That magazine is a huge gateway to so many other things. That's why it's so important to get there. Exactly. I mean, that magazine, that Newport story, <laughs> a bank holding company headquartered in Rhode Island calls me up and offers me their annual report. Now, when I say offer, he offers me a shot at their annual report. Sure. He sends me to his design firm with a portfolio for, for a look-see. The designer, who's the head of the firm, wants to use a guy in San Francisco. Okay. He doesn't want to use me at all. He's, he's, doing, he's seeing me as a favor to the... The guy at the bank calls him up after I show him my book, and he says, so what's the deal? And the guy says, well, you know, he's good. Uh, I can't say he's not. Uh, and he says, is, is his portfolio as good as the guy in San Francisco's? He said, well, yeah. He says, I still want to use the guy in San Francisco. And this guy says, I want to use Paul. He's my photographer. So I get the job. This does not make Sid real happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could piss off somebody. Yeah. So the first few shoots that Sid and I did together uh, were strained to say the least. I'm sure. But then we shot the cover. And then we shot the cover. But the bank changed its name from Industrial National Bank to Fleet. And they had a logo made by an artist in brass about yay big and we photographed this new logo for the cover and I killed it we did it in the living room of my house in Connecticut what did you do? Um, well when you shoot brass the problem with brass is that it doesn't look like brass when you shoot it mm -hmm. especially on daylight film so I lit it with daylight but shot it with tungsten. Okay. And then I reversed it and I shot it with daylight and lit it with tungsten. Now, okay, so where do you learn that technique? Because you're not technically trained. You didn't go to four years of school. So where are you picking up that knowledge? All the stuff I read. I, I, I read constantly. So you were just absorbing anything Sucking you could get in into your hands. every bit of information that I could get. Because that's a trick, the daylight tungsten flip. Oh, yeah. And the, the cover was just killer. Yeah, they probably never even thought of where to go with that. No. Sid still didn't like me a lot, but he knew I could make pictures at right. that point. He doesn't so. need to like you. You're not no. living with Sid, but if you make him art that he likes, we're done. That's exactly. our relationship. That bank, I shot their annual report for 17 years. That's a relationship. Yes. They changed design firms three times. And kept you on board. And kept me. That says something. Wow. So... Now, are you feeling very, like, your palette is getting much broader, right? You start off as sports, and now you're, you're doing annual reports. Are you feeling like, wow, I'm able to do a lot of things now? Yeah, um, I am. I'm, I'm starting to really look at, at actually at looking at getting out of sports. Because as good a gig as Sports Illustrated was, they still only paid $300 a day. Right. And Dominus had, was no longer picture editor. Um, our Barbara Hankel was picture editor. And I'll be... Barbara was not the success that they hoped she would be. Right. Barbara was the first picture editor in the history of the magazine to actually be fired from the company. They yeah. fired other picture editors. Well, they fired Dominus. But when they fired Dominus, they gave him a corporate con contract, an office on the 28th floor, and a basically unlimited budget to go out and do whatever he wanted to do. Now, why do you think they fired him, and then we know why she, they, she was fired? Because she was just a failure. Yes. So, they well, fired Dominus because <laughs> Gil Rogan was the managing editor at the time, and Rogan didn't like the fact that he really didn't run the photo department. Dominus ran the photo department. Right. And... Gil could make suggestions, but Dominus often 
overrid him. Overrode him. Yeah. And Rogan wanted control of the photo department. When they fired Dominus, they actually hired... Um, God, I'm losing his name. Um, he was picture editor of the Topeka Capital Journal. Oh. And later became picture editor of uh, National Geographic. I can see it. Yeah, you can see his name and I can see his name. It'll pop into my head in a minute. But at any rate. We promise you in 10 minutes we'll come up with a name. <laughs> exactly. I'm in Pittsburgh shooting a Pittsburgh, uh, a Pitt football game. And about half an hour before the game starts, I called Laurel Frankel, who was the deputy editor on the on the shoot, uh, to find out if there was anything new that I needed mm -hmm. to know. Right. And Laurel says, are you sitting down? I said, no. She said, sit down. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> she says, he's not coming. He called last night and said he can't, he decided he can't work in New York and he's not gonna take the job. They gave the job to Barbara Henkel. I didn't need to sit down, I fell down. Oh. So that was pretty much, at that point, I'm like, okay, it's time to go. You felt that the, the, it was time. The sports or the, the, how many basketball games can you shoot? How many football games can right. you shoot? You know, before you get, oh, what am I going to do with the next one? But with the corporate work, not only are they paying a huge amount of money more than SI is paying. Oh, five, ten times the amount. Exactly. But you've got completely different subjects to shoot. Yes. You can really go out there on a limb and make pictures that are going to make people go, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's not a basketball game. Right. Yeah. So... The I, issue is people see that Sports Illustrated and go, oh, that's so sexy. You work for Sports Illustrated. Oh, yeah. And you can see it at a dinner conversation. And everybody wants to know, oh, Paul, tell us, please. Do you do a swimsuit? Do you do the Super Bowl? And you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, and you bang off some names. I did this. I did that. No one says, oh, what annual report, Paul, are you working on? Please tell us. That sounds so interesting. Yeah. No, that doesn't happen. Everybody <laughs> walks away and you're like standing there going, but no, yeah. really, the <laughs> annual report. Yes, come back. You got it. That's the thing. It's just, it's not sexy. But if they saw your bank account, they'd be like, damn, Paul, good idea. Yeah. And that's just it. At that time in our lives, we needed a bank account because we had a son who's, well, by the time he was 11, his medical bills were $1.7 million. Jesus. So, yeah. There's, so, there's, we needed bank. Yeah. You needed it. Yeah. How were you fe feeling, okay, I'm going to be able to do it elsewhere? I'm going to go walk away from Sports Illustrated. I'm going to pick up other work elsewhere. I... At that point, I really wasn't that concerned about it. I, I not only wasn't concerned about it, I moved to California. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Connecticut guy, and SI had sent me out here to California for a shoot. And when I left Connecticut, it was 4 degrees. When I landed in California, it was 84 degrees. And I went, uh, I picked up the phone, I called my wife and said, Honey, we're moving. <laughs> what did they send you out here to do? Uh, a track meet in San Diego. Uh, oh, and even in San Diego of all places. Uh, exactly. Now, if they said, you know, Barstow or Bakersfield or something, Fresno, they would have fooled you. But San Diego, yep. that's not fair. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't fair. To, my wife was really not exci excited about a move because that takes her away from all her friends, her family. 3,000 miles away. You know, and I'm moving without a job. It's not like I've got work out here that somebody's going to pay me. I'm moving and saying, hell, I'll find work. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, I'm barely out here, and I get a call from Don Delacuani, who has left Sports Illustrated himself because his wife had taken, his wife was an attorney, and she had taken a job uh, here in Los Angeles for a, a major law firm. And so Don making the lesser of the two salaries, comes out to L.A. and immediately gets hired by the Olympic Committee for the 1984 Olympic Games. So he calls me up and he asks me if I'm interested in being one of the official photographers for the L.A. OOC for the Games. And I'm like, well, maybe. Because I'm thinking, you know, it's sports again and uh, you know yeah, you're trying to walk away and you're trying to get yeah, me back in exactly it's that Michael Corion thing that keeps sucking you back there in you go. it keeps sucking you back in so he says well write us a letter uh, of application 
and he gives me all the information. I don't write the letter. <laughs> About a month goes by, and I get a call from somebody on the committee, uh, a, a woman, I don't recall her name, um, and she said, we were expecting a letter from you, but we haven't gotten it yet. And I said, okay, okay, I'll write the letter. And I didn't write the letter. <laughs> so now Your I, heart was really in this. Yeah, my heart was really in it. <laughs> so I've got to shoot an assignment for a sailboat manufacturer. They make a large line of sailboats, everything from virtual dinghy to a you know, super yacht. And they've got a, uh, a dealer, a marina on the Red River in Texas uh, that has their whole line of boats. And so we're going to go down there for a week and shoot. So on day three, I've got a helicopter and we're doing helicopter shots all day. And at, at one point we fly over a, a, a little restaurant right on the river in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing around it. And I'm, I sit at a helicopter pilot, Jesus, must be a hell of a restaurant <laughs> if it can survive in the middle of nowhere. I said, let's go there for lunch. So we land, take a lunch break. A bunch of us, about five or six of us, jump in a car and drive over to this restaurant. We walk in the door. And as we're walking in the door, the f you can hear the phone ringing in the kitchen. This woman sticks her head out the door. I, I kid you not. She must have weighed 400 pounds. She was huge. There are Paul Kennedy here? I'm like, I figured it was somebody from the marina, something had gone wrong, because who else knows we're here, right? Yeah, right. You're at this little hole in the wall in the middle of nowhere. Exactly. And I said, yeah, that's me. She, boom. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in the kitchen and I answer the phone, and it's a woman from the committee. Now, I, I'm like, Huh? How the hell did she find me? And she says, we haven't gotten your letter. And so what we want to know is if you get the, if we offer you the job, will you take it? And I said, if you offer me the job, you, you just, you found, how did you find me? <laughs> and she said, let me tell you, it wasn't easy. <laughs> will you take the job? I said, I'll take the job. I'll take the job. <laughs> you got me. She said, thank you very much. Hangs up. So I finish my shoot in Texas, and I fly home, and I get home, and there's film, 300 rolls of film waiting for me from Fuji, which is the official film of the game. There's all kinds of other crap from everybody you can imagine who's somehow inv involved with the games. Congratulations on being a photographer for the Olympic Games, yada, yada, yada. McDonald's, Coke, whatever. You're just wrapped in merchandise. Exactly. Now, Canon is the official photographer for the, for, for the games. Right, yes. I'm a Nikon shooter. I get a call from the national sales manager for Canon at the time. What would it take to get you to use Canon equipment for the games? I said, make me an offer. He said, how about if we loan you equipment in advance so you can get used to it and... You know, you'd be familiar with it, but because as you probably know, everything was backwards. Yeah, it's all backwards. So I said, I'd need it right away. He said, okay, this is January. He says, okay, um, I'll have a, a messenger at your house this afternoon with our catalog. Pick what you want, and we'll get it to you as fast as possible. So now, remember, this is 1983. Right. 84 now. We're, we're in January 84. I picked like $65,000 worth of gear. You know, and that's a lot back then. Oh, it's a ton back then. It's a 300 28, 400 28, 600 F4, 5, then not a F4, Nikon an F4. Right. Cannons was an F4, 5, and had that screwy yeah, focusing that system. Yeah, funky little knob screwy yeah, system. Exactly. A couple of cameras. I already had them. Well, I had bought a Canon camera. I was upset at Nikon after the America's Cup because uh, I'll go into that. Talk about that later. But anyway. <laughs> I had bought a Canon that I was just kind of screwing around with. So I get like, I think four or five cameras, a uh, bunch of other gear, you know, wide angle lenses, normal lenses, medium telephotos. Zooms really sucked at the time. Oh God, they were awful. Awful. So I didn't, I didn't want these. Zooms. Yeah. State of the primes back exactly. then. Exactly. Yeah. They send it all to me in a week. I get all of this stuff in a week. So I start using it. That must've been a hell of a delivery at the oh, house. Oh, it was. It was amazing. Amazing. 
I mean, <laughs> UPS shows up and it starts unloading boxes. Yeah, the whole truck must have been you. Yeah, it, pretty much. It was it was remarkable. Like a cannon stuff all over the place. Right. <laughs> boxes and you know styrofoam and packing <laughs> material. Yada yada yada. So I, you know, comes the games. I'm ready. I I I know the equipment. I'm doing well with it. I shoot cannons for the games. Well, they had the LLOC published a broadsheet-sized newspaper, every magazine really, every day with a color cover. Everything inside was black and white, but the color, mm-hmm. the cover was color. They published fifteen of them, one for each day of the games. Your odds of getting one of those covers were none and no friggin' way, uh, because they had every credentialed photographer whose film came through the Fuji lab that was in the press center to right. choose from. Yeah. So, you know, there's thousands of frames of film Tons. every day. Yeah. So your chance of getting any one of those 15 covers was zero. Now, who are you working with at this time? Who's the other team members? Uh, all, well, there were seven photographers chosen to be part of this. And, you know, some of the better photographers in the country. And, and a couple of people who weren't well known, but their their portfolios right. have been good. So, sure. I get two of the fifteen covers. That's like winning the lotto five times in a week. Exactly. And then two the, out of fifteen. Yes. And then for the closing ceremonies, I initially don't have a spot for the closing ceremonies. I'm not assigned to the closing ceremonies, and I'm a little irritated about that. So I, you know bring that up and they they give me a spot in the middle of this stadium because you know the coliseum right i mean it couldn't have been a worse spot i'm halfway up the stadium and sitting next to regular fans yeah regular jim and patrons, carol jim and right. carol exactly um there's i got <laughs> I no angles yeah i'm paul and you got camera gear too right exactly <laughs> that too right uh, so I, I'm, I'm like, okay, uh, I kind of got screwed here. I got to figure out how to do something with this. So I do whatever I can. And the next day they call me up and tell me that Lionel Richie has chosen one of my photographs to be the double truck picture he's uh, bought as an, uh, for the ad he's putting in Variety magazine, thanking the Olympic Committee for making him the, the show for the... Right, because everybody forgets he, he was had that album out, and that's all we were dancing to in 1984. Exactly, and he chose my photograph for the double truck opener, or the double truck picture that he for the he advertising did, he ran an ad for, right, saying thank you to the committee for making him the entertainment at the and closing the, ceremonies, at the right? Closing yeah. ceremonies, and it was my photograph that he used. Wow! So I kind of hit a home run. Yeah, I would say so. Bases loaded, bottom of the ninth. Full count, and you just jacked it. And from that point on, it was like, I mean, corporate work, you, you name it. I, I was going guns a-blazing. Wow. What a moment. Okay, so what were the two out of the 15? Do you remember? Yeah, one was co- a sailing picture, and the other was a wrestling picture. Those can't be further from what anything. They're not even close. I mean, sailing is, you know, were you on the water or yes. there? Wow. And wrestling, Jesus, Roman, Gro- what was it uh, uh, Greco-Roman or Greco-Roman? Oh my God, Jeez, Louise, that's unbelievable. Do you still have those covers somewhere? <laughs> yeah, in a box somewhere, yes. slightly faded, yeah. pressed with all the other stuff. <laughs> so you're like Carl Lewis; it ends, and you're the man. Uh, it was, I, it, 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 so many good things happened so effortlessly that it almost wasn't real. Where where are you feeling right now? Because your career is just skyrocketing. It just keeps going and going and going. You're like that guy. That parts of this rocket ship keep coming off and you just keep going up. Are you feeling at your stage like you're getting better every couple of months? Like you're learning still? Are you still? Or? I'm still learning. Yeah. I never stop learning. I spend some time every day on the computer looking stuff up, trying to learn more. Where do you get that from? I, I, I don't really know. Um, Mom, dad, grandma, grandpa? 
a competitive fire? Um, I mean, the competitive fire, my grandfather started as an office boy uh, at 14 and uh, retired as the senior vice president of the, one of the, 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 at the, at the time, the largest copper company in the world. Um, my father was a high school dropout, ended up as a college professor. Um, hell, I was a high school dropout. I quit high school at 16. I ended up graduating from college, right. but, um, yeah, no, I... Isn't that funny? Didn't need high school, just took care of college. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually went back to high school. After yeah. a year, I realized, you, know, you can't get anywhere out of a high school diploma. <laughs> I was actually president of the senior class. Have <laughs> Paul, that's great. So... Well, let's back up because the, the photo and you have it here in the house that I remember and it's just that it's that photo of Gretzky's that portrait on the cover of him flipping the puck. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. He's a kid. You're a kid. Yeah, basically. You know, right? I mean, you're you're under thirty probably at the time, nineteen eighty, eighty one. I was just over thirty. Okay. Uh, He's it's his second or third year with the Edmonton? Cause no, he, no. It's was that first his, year. Was that his rookie year? First year. He played that one year with the Indianapolis and the yeah, World. Yeah, he was in the World Hockey League. The World Hockey and League. And they traded him to Edmonton at the end of the year. And he played a couple of games with Edmonton, but not enough to lose his rookie status. Okay. So in the fall, he's a rookie. And SI decides to do a cover on him. And in those days, they never did hockey covers. Never, right? So, never. like, even for them to have seen your your stuff with the whalers and was, were impressed with it to give you this cover of a sport that when they always said this, I know David Caluto was a big hockey guy. Like when they put, put the, would put hockey on the cover, it would lose like 35% of of rack sales because people would be like, nobody wants to see that crap. Exactly. Where's football? Where's baseball? Where's hockey? Boxing was the, yes. Football or boxing were the two biggest covers at the year. Yes. Duran, Sugar Ray, you know, Leonard Thomas, those guys. My Gretzky cover was the number two selling cover of the year. I bet it was because it was simple, but it was this kid, this phenomenon that was literally like you try to compare and you can't LeBron, uh, the Williams sisters, you know, Michael, Kobe, what he did to hockey at his age. Unbelievable. Okay. Like you look at his numbers. Changed. Ch- changed everything. Yes. Changed how the the media in this in this country looked at hockey. Right, because it was a joke. Yeah, they didn't pay any attention to hockey really, unless you, there was hockey in their city, New York, Hartford, whatever. Right. You know, if you were in Detroit. Hartford and said you work with the Whalers and went down to South Carolina, they'd be, "What's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> exactly. Ain't no Whales in <laughs> South Carolina." Yeah. Right. But he, so, what was it like working with him at that time? Gressy was awesome. He was. <laughs> 19 years old, of course, in Edmonton, he could have anything he wanted. If he walked into a bar, they'd serve him. didn't matter that it was 21. But right. Gretzky wasn't that kind of person. Right. That's the thing. He was straight. His girlfriend at the time was a, uh, was a torch singer, a lounge singer. And she was 21, but he wasn't. And he'd go to watch her sing, and he'd drink juice. Or, right. Or, or, milk, teetotal and milk. And yeah, just. Didn't want to put anybody on a spot. And he was a small guy too. You think Wasn't of, that big? No. Yeah, you think of hockey players. No, he was not. No, he probably didn't weigh more than 175 pounds, maybe 180 at most. At most, I at think most. that's giving him credit. Yeah, I think it probably is giving him a little credit. Yeah, because I've heard him talk. He's like, man, it was all for the pads. I didn't. I was skinny. Oh yeah, he was. He yeah, was. he was all legs and butt, and everything from the waist up was rail thin. He couldn't have been nicer to me. He couldn't have been. I mean, he was just a great person to work with. We spent, what, eight days together, and he was total commitment. And Glenn Sather, head coach of the Oilers, made things really difficult. Sather believed in the Sports Illustrated cover jinx. Did he really? Oh, yeah. He believed it like it was See, Yeah, if people gospel. don't realize that, they always felt if you were on the cover, it was over. Well, Sather believed it. When I got to Edmonton, truckload of equipment, you know, we pull up to the gate of Northlands Coliseum, and this kid, I don't know, probably 19, 20 year old guard comes, steps out of the, the little guard booth, and I said, Hi, my name's Paul Kennedy, I'm from Sports Illustrated. Uh, and he says, uh, Yeah, we've uh, been expecting you. Um, uh, Mr. Sather has barred you from the premises. <laughs> That can't be the worst thing you can hear. That's horrible. Yeah, it was pretty pretty bad. 
And I'm thinking, I'm really, I'm barred from I'm Sports Illustrated here to do you know, a story, cover a story, and I'm barred from the premises. So I, uh, Northlands Coliseum, there was a hotel, uh, uh, I forget, Best Western or something, Marriott, something, right, right across the street. So I went there, because, you know, no cell phones. <laughs> I went there to get a phone, and I called New York, and New York gave me uh, Ziegler's number, president okay. of the National Hockey League. So I call Ziegler's office, and I get his secretary, and I explain to her what's going on, and Ziegler gets on the phone, and he got to explain it again, and he says, give me 15 minutes to go back to the gate. So I wait 15 minutes, and I drive back to the gate. And the little the guard comes out, same kid. Same you know. kid now. He says, uh, Coach Sather says to tell you that you're still <laughs> barred from the premises, and you have 15 minutes a day with Gretzky. <laughs> <laughs> this poor kid's in the middle, man. I know. Just... <laughs> oh, okay. Now you say they won't even talk to me yeah, directly. Right? Not... <laughs> you don't exist to this guy. Exactly. So now I got to make magic. So I get first, but it's October in Edmonton. Yeah. How much ice time do you think is available? Not much. None. You can't. You can't. Everybody's rent. going. I mean, you got junior teams and peewee teams and kid teams and uh, high school teams and whatever. Everybody's ice got ice time rented. Yeah. There's ice hockey arenas. In fact, I find an arena that's only about a half a mile away from Northlands Coliseum, but they've got no ice time. Right. They're so, booked solid. So I've got to buy that ice time from all those people who already own it. I want to do that six shot multiple exposure. So I've got to have ice time for that. I figure I'll shoot the cover. I can shoot that anywhere. Sure. So I rent a, a conference room in that hotel right across the street from Northlands Coliseum. Uh, I fly, get all that black felt and get it shipped into Edmonton. I get the strobe stri- shipped in. We take three days and set up this arena. So let's talk about that. Wh- whose idea was the multiple exposure shot? Mine. Okay. Now, had you had done it before, or was this something like you just envisioned in your head? First multiple exposure I ever shot in my life. Oh, of course it was. <laughs> wow, are you kidding? No, I'm not. I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I had an idea on the plane coming up. I thought, you know, a, a multiple exposure of Gretzky's slap shot would be really compelling. Did you run it by anybody? No. So then your idea is, okay, I got to blacken this baby out. Yeah, you got to black out the background because fire that much strobe light six times. Right. It's going to wipe out your background. Sure. So you need black felt. That's got to be zero. Exactly. I mean, black felt absorbs 99.6% of the light that hits it. So you can hit it six times with strobes and it's still going to be black. Um, got The ice has got to be black because it'll reflect the light. Right. So I left Kretzky as three-foot strip of ice to skate in. I had black felt behind him, black felt in front of him. Jeez, Louise, how much felt do you think you... I, I, there wasn't much left, right? Uh, I, South America I, probably had it, and that's yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. I bought every yard I'd get my hands on. I mean, you you must and have I, been hanging for days. We Well, I hired a crew of guys, and we just we draped the seats. We draped the I, the glass. Um, the, the boards, the, everything. The boards, ice, everything. See, that's real craftsman. We talked about this before we started. Now it's Photoshop. They would just say, shoot it, and we'll just Photoshop stuff. We'll do it. But then you had to do all the work. Yep. And that's before you take the picture. And you had to know what to do. Right. And <laughs> I, was, I was flying blind <laughs> because I'd never done this before. Literally never done a, a, a multiple exposure before. Who did, you, did you lean on anybody or did you just... No, I just tried to figure it out. A little prayer and God help well, us. Let's I keep... looked at, at um, you know, you can find photographs mm-hmm. uh, online, or not online, in, in magazines. And sometimes you can find some explanation of, of how they did it. Right. Um, and so that's basically what I did was look up some stuff and figure out, oh, okay, let's Kentucky windage this and see how it works. Plus, I only had 15 minutes. So it's not like, I mean, you've a six shot yeah. multiple exposure. I want to shoot it 400 times. Yeah. And then maybe another 400 just in case. Yeah. Easy. 11 frames. 11. I shot it on a Hasselblad mounted on a tripod because okay. it had to have a stable right. moving camera. 
and I fired the strobes with an Icon F3 with, uh, with freshly charged NICOD batteries, and, and an F3 with, with freshly charged NICOD batteries would fire at six frames a second. Wow. So the camera is, fi- the Hasselblad's open, the Nikon fires the strobes, you don't care about the Nikon or what it's doing, no. you just need to get it on the 120 film. Right. Or 220, whatever it yeah, was, get it square, yeah, and just hope, wing and a prayer. Yeah, uh, and it's just locking the, the shutter open on bulb on the Hasselblad. Right, and the six frames was what you wanted, you thought that would be the great look of the slap shot. Yes, and six frames in one second would be just about a perfect time lapse for Gretzky skating that distance. Right, there, that's where math comes into play, where you've got to figure like four would be too little, eight's too much. Yep. Yeah. Six is perfect because it gives you that, well, you've that seen the right. that arc. Oh, that I arc had it in perfect. my room. Yeah. 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 And the arc was what I was going for. Yeah. I remember another Kennedy, Joe Kennedy, who Joe was at Kennedy. the LA Times. And I remember asking him years later, like, how? What's going on here? And he broke it down and explained to me, reverse engineer, like, this is what was going on. And I was like, wow, that's so much work for, for that magic. Yeah, my math professor or my math teacher in high school, who happily flunked me on a regular occasion, would have been <laughs> blown away by the math idea. <laughs> he might have reevaluated your grade and given yeah. you maybe like a C minus. Yeah. <laughs> Eight days. Well, that's you can't get that anymore. Oh no, no. Uh, I mean, part of it was because Sather wouldn't give us any time. Right. You know, I was going out at night with Gretzky and making you know shots in his behind apartment, the scenes behind stuff, the scene yeah, kind of stuff. And then they had an exhibition game uh, because it was preseason mm-hmm. on Saturday, and, and of course you say they couldn't keep me from a, a credential for that. Sure. So I had a credential, and I made a shot there that was another one of the images that ran in the in the sh- in the article. Um, it was just everything came together properly. Right. Everything was right. Um, even the hotel. Uh, when we shot, the, I found a camera store that had background paper that was the same orange as the orange in the in the Oilers uniforms. So that was my background. Yeah, see, I always thought that was interesting because that was such a vibrant color that mm-hmm. was not very Sports Illustrated. No, not at all. Yeah, their t- colors were always muted, especially early in the magazines. They were never very vibrant in anything they did. Nope. So I went for vibrant. I wanted I wanted to, I could have gone the blue. Sure. But I wanted the orange because I thought the orange would pop off the page. Oh, absolutely. It's, I'm sure if it, when you saw it on a rack and you were walking by, you just got off your TWA flight, boom, who's this kid with the blonde hair? And, and the Oilers wouldn't, say there wouldn't even let us use Gretzky's uniform. We had to order a uniform from, I think it was CCM. Yeah. God, was he helpful. Oh, pain. <laughs> total pain. Now, anytime I tell anybody hashing stories around, like how to deal with TV or media and stuff, I always bring your name up because there was a story when you were talking in a lecture about how you were shooting hockey strobed and TV didn't like your strobes because you were screwing up TV and the way you handled it. (laughs) Tell me that story again. It's been 30 some odd years since I heard it. And I absolutely love to tell it to young photographers like, you want to talk about balls? This guy brought brass ones to the hockey game. <laughs> so I, sh- <laughs> I shoot the opening. Sorry to make it so vulgar, but when no, I tell no. people, because they're just like, he, he did that? <laughs> yeah. And he fucking owned it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, I dropped, they dropped the puck to start the game. I fire my camera. I got no strokes. Now, where are you at? I'm, at that point, I'm in the penalty box. No, no. What, what arena? Oh, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. The lovely town of brotherly love. Exactly. What's, what's the story? What are you covering? Uh, it's the, the finals. Against two. Philly and... Uh, Philly and the, the uh, Islanders. Islanders, right? Because yeah. they were in it forever. They yeah, won like four exactly. in a row. And so it's big. Mm-hmm. All right. So this game means something. Yes. Oh, totally. <laughs> Paul's getting paid. needs to make his money. Right. And I need to make pictures. I mean, and, and my strobes don't work. And we're shooting strobes. What are we going to do, do if we don't have strobes? Do you have an assistant at the time? Yes. Okay, so you go to him and go, what the hell? No. I knew what would happen. I knew that it screwed me. I knew somebody cut my cables up in the catwalk. I knew it. That's rotten. Yeah, well, that's, that's NBC. Right. <laughs> so I, I sent my assistant out with a handful of carpet tacks. And I said, tack. Of course, in those days, the cameras all operate on coaxial cable. Mm-hmm. So cable went from the camera back to the truck. 
you stick a thumbtack, or, or better yet, a carpet tack in a coaxial cable, and that camera's off the air. Yeah, it's dead. They had seven cameras. I put six of them off the air. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. So you're calmly sitting there, and? I'm calmly sitting there, and this assistant director comes storming up to me, wanting to know what happened. I said, my, why? Is something wrong? <laughs> I said, how unusual. My strobes don't work, and what, your cameras don't work? Wow, how, can you imagine the oddity of that? <laughs> the odds. I said, now, if my strobes were to start working again, who knows? Maybe your cameras might start working again. Maybe you should give that a thought. So they sent their technician back up into the catwalk and patched my <laughs> wires. And I sent my assistant out and pulled the clutch. The, they just searched forever oh, for yeah, those carpet Oh, yeah, they weren't going to find it. There's miles of cable. They never would have exactly. found it. They never would have found it. In the dark. I mean, he could have walked right by it never seen it. Exactly. So a resolution was reached. My strobes worked. Their cameras worked again. You should have worked for the U.N. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe not. But, but the, the, the balls of them to think they could do that to your property. Well, television thinks that. Right. And it's not like you're Joe Schmo. You're, and it doesn't make it any better. Like you, or you are with Sports Illustrated. So you're there with a purpose. You're with a national magazine. I'm sure you know most of those cameramen. You probably rubbed elbows with them enough. We rubbed elbows. Sometimes they were not the most friendly of elbow rubs. Right. Um, we got along really well with CBS and ABC, but NBC we didn't get along with at all. Why do you think that was? Just their crew? It was uh, the hierarchy at NBC was very confrontational. Bastards. Yeah, and they were not fun to work with. Well, I love that story. I love telling that to young kids. Like, you don't take crap from anybody. No. Right? Don't. You're there to make a picture, and damn it, your client wants those pictures made. Exactly. And you've got just as much right to be there shooting as they do. And the fact that they don't like the strobes. You know what? In, in those days, especially at SI, because our strobes were speedatrons, and they had those heads specially made in Germany. Our duration times were about one twelve hundredth of a second. You barely see that on a television camera. Because right. a television camera is operating at one one thirtieth of a second. Right. So you're seeing like a blip. In a fraction of a, a fraction, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. Right. Ninety percent of the people in television land. Ninety. Ninety-nine percent don't even see those strokes Not going at all. off. You have to point it out to them. Yeah. Say, see that blip? That's the photographer's strokes going off. And then they're still like, where, where? Yeah. But, I don't. I don't see it. But these guys were just assholes. Sorry. Right. No, they were. But mm -hmm. I love it. So we forward back to after the Olympics. Now, are you deciding that like, freelance is my thing? Or do you ever look at like, I'm doing so well, should I look and see if there's a corporate job? No, I, I was always freelance. <clears throat> and you, you were comfortable with it. Did you understand business well enough to make sure that you were taking care of yourself? Yes and no. I wasn't the best businessman in the world. And, and uh, certainly, uh, I, as we, we briefly spoke about young people not knowing how to run a business when they graduate from a, a photo school. Um, I was definitely part of that, but I learned it. You know, I, I had to learn it. Right. Um, if you're going to be a freelance photographer, if you're going to live paycheck to paycheck or, or assignment to assignment, you got to know how to stick a little away and make sure everything's covered. And plan for the future. Plan for the future. Make sure the tax man's taken care of. Make sure the tax man's taken care of. That's always an, an issue. So many photographers get behind because they spend everything and then comes tax time and they go, oops, I don't have any money to pay the taxes. Yeah, what do you mean I need $3,500? Yeah, well, I wish it was $3,500. Yeah, whatever it was. <laughs> I mean, it's always a certain amount and it yep. crushes you. Yeah, exactly. So you got to plan for that. Um, you got to you got to learn the rules and play by those rules because you can't make those rules. Somebody else makes those rules, and you really have no say in it, so you have to figure out how to live within them. Right. Did you have uh, – how were your challenges then in that 80s, the late 80s that was going through? Were you, were you just working – all the time? I was working a lot of the time, yeah. Um, I had, at that point, I wasn't working for Sports Illustrated at all anymore. I was doing a lot of work for the New York Times. Uh, Steve Fine, who 
ultimately was the picture editor at Sports Illustrated. Right. He had left SI because of Barbara and had gone to the New York Times. And he started calling me on a regular basis. I was doing stuff for Steve all the time. Um, and then various other magazines and then corporate publications. I was getting a lot of work from corporate publications. Plus doing the annual reports. Right. And how, are you, how are you marketing then? Because obviously it's pre-internet. So were you cold calling, postcards? Like how were you getting your name out? Or were you relying on the work? I was relying on the work. And, totally. it, was, and it was enough? Oh, yeah. Would you have ever thought at the time, like, oh, I should open up a studio or I should, like, partnerize with somebody else and split some of this? I briefly thought about a studio, very briefly. Um, basically, I, I had seen so many what I thought were good photographers end up on the ropes because they opened a studio and then couldn't meet the overhead. Studios are fixed overhead. You've got to pay that overhead every month. And it can be crushing if the work doesn't come in one month. And right. If it doesn't come in two months, you're out the door. Yeah. And I saw that. And right off the bat, I, I mean, right from the get-go, I was, I like, I love the location work. I wanted to go to some, I didn't want to have someone send me stuff to a studio and then figure out how to make it look like their business. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to their business and do the shoots. I loved shooting in factories. I loved, uh, I did a shoot at uh, John Deere and I mean, this is massive production line oh huge yeah huge equipment and if people don't understand how big farm equipment is oh, no, it's the size don't. of small homes exactly exactly and so i mean if you're going to light this and i lit everything i would travel at there were times when i traveled with as much as 12,000 watt seconds worth of light traveled with it good god and then i would rent some uh, whatever you needed where, yeah if i needed more i'd rent it wherever i was yeah all speedo or normans what was it all back? normans normans yeah. yeah, I liked Normans because they were a little lighter. Speedos were heavy. Oh, yeah, that's a workout oh, right totally. there. Uh, I mean, 35, 40, or no, 40 plus pounds per power pack. Yeah. And then the heads were nothing. To, uh, yeah. You can, massive. You can bog down your bags real quick packing those babies. But speedage, or uh, excuse me, Normans were smaller. Sure. Didn't weigh as much. Uh, the heads were smaller, but they still pumped out 2,000 watt seconds. And that's what you need. And they were reliable. And a Speedatron... If a Speedatron broke on you, there wasn't much chance you were going to fix it yourself. But if a Norman broke on you, you could often repair it yourself. A soldering gun, you could probably kind of figure it out. Exactly. How did you keep pushing yourself and challenging yourself through all those projects? That's all I ever do. I, I, I totally challenge myself every time I go out the door. Yeah, because you can look at those annual reports and start to become like like sports, kind of cookie cutter. Okay, another portrait of a CEO, a big shiny desk, a moose head. See, those weren't the images I was shooting. Right, that's what you don't want. Exactly. But that's what so many annual reports are. Yeah. So for you to be like over the top creative, how were you coming up with those? I once I had an assignment to shoot an oil rig that was had been built in Louisiana and was being transported to the Georgia's banks. Okay. So it's got to be pulled by tugboats all around the, uh, all the way around the tip of Florida and all up the East Coast. So given the weather at the time, I'm thinking Florida is a better shooting opportunity. Uh, plus I can easily get helicopters and they're going to be coming fairly close to the, to the shore in Florida. So I, I chose Florida as the place that I would shoot. And I did the shot hanging upside down underneath the helicopter. Oh, you just didn't want to use the door, the regular door, like most people. Well, if, if you've shot, <laughs> Paul, and, and I'm sure you've shot you're some not helicopters. You're a teeny Chinese, you know, acrobat. Like, what the hell were you thinking? What I was thinking was, there's no way I'll be, I'll get the um, the rotor blades in the image. Oh, you wanted, yeah. Well, right. You need those out. Yeah. So that was it, hanging your ass upside down. Yep. You nail it. Oh yeah. Got Banged you. it. Killed it. God love you. <laughs> wow. What did the pilot say? Did you explain what we're doing here? Yep, yep. I explained it to the pilot, and he said, well, okay. Um, <laughs> hope you don't get too much blood in your head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I was, I had some aerial shoots that were interesting, and happily I had pilots that were willing to uh, go along with me. Did you enjoy getting those shots from the air? 
I loved helicopter shoots. Um, I loved all the aerial shoots. I did an aerial shoot on an airplane once <laughs> with my leg hooked around the the back at the frame of, of the rear door and my foot on on the, the wheel. Yeah. On the wheel. On the wheel. This is on a, in an airplane. Oh, on an airplane shooting a helicopter. Yeah. No, shooting another airplane. Oh god. Jesus. I'm I got one I had the pilot lock the parking brake on the wheel so that I could use the wheel as a as, as a brace. As a right. brace. And I've got my other foot hooked in the door frame to give me some stability and I've got <laughs> I've got a rope tied around my waist tied to this seatbelt. <laughs> That's totally safe. <laughs> but you made the picture. So uh, people would say you know, why, do you, why did you take those kind of risks? And my response was, the client doesn't pay me to come back with an excuse why I didn't get the photograph. The client pays me to get the picture. That's the one and only thing I think of out there. How do I get the picture? That's it. That's it. Really, it, that's a simple. If that's your motto, that's simple. I'm get here to get the picture. Yeah. At those times, what were some of the best pictures you were making in those late 80s, early 90s? Because now we're not talking covers. It's not Gretzky or no, no. Olympics and stuff. So what were those things you were making that you were like satisfying your soul? I was starting to do medical photography. So I was making images in operating rooms. And that can get pretty exciting um, uh, and, and difficult because you've got multiple light sources mm -hmm. and... With film, that's difficult. Uh, I loved it when digital came along because I didn't have to worry about the light sources right. anymore. Or at least you could see them. Yes, exactly. Um, a, a lot of stuff that I was shooting in manufacturing plants, I was finding ways to shoot stuff that was dramatically complicated. Right. You know? I remember that you that's a lot of stuff you showed yeah. in that lecture, and it was just mind-blowing. What a simple emergency room and all the equipment and the way you lit it and shot it. It was like, wow, that actually looks like an interesting ER room or, you know, factory. Well, and, and that's always been what I've tried to do with the images is not, I don't want just an image. I want the image. So, I mean, it's like I said, they don't pay you for an image. They pick, they pay you for the image. Right. I mean, they, they don't want just some crap they could see on TV. They right. want a they picture. They can let AP get that shot. Exactly, exactly. And AP will. Right. But it's, it's something different. And so that's always what I was going for, was something different, something that you wouldn't see in every other image that you saw. Now, you touched on it. When digital was starting to come around and mature, did you embrace it or were you late to the game? I embraced it so rapidly I was I couldn't wait for it I was hearing about it I was seeing it you know and 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 the teasers the Canon and Nikon and whatever right. you know um back I had, at, I'm sure you were back in line at the camera store oh uh, Cal's camera <laughs> Cal's, Cal's loved camera, me God Cal's loved me I was I would go out on annual report shoots and I'd run out of film and I, I wouldn't trust buying film anywhere else I'd have my wife go to Cal's and buy 100, 200, 300 rolls of film and and Cal's would ship it to me. Jesus. And they would... Cal was great. God love Cal's. Cal was awesome. I mean, my wife would walk in the door and say, Paul needs this. And Cal would just hand it to her and say, tell Paul to come in when he's back. No money, no, no, no promissory, no signature, no nothing. Just hand it to her across the counter or, or say, does Paul need us to ship it? Yeah. Right. Where's Paul at? Where's he at? We'll take care of it. That's that's a relationship so valued and so helpful to the photographer. I'm so sorry that Cal's is no longer in business because they were they were almost like a team member. Right. Yeah. I knew that I if I desperately needed something, I could call Cal's and they would find a way to get it to him. That's priceless, really. Yeah. So when digital comes around, you're all in. How are you understanding, okay, we got archive nows differently. You know, it's not like slides and hard drives and computers. Were you just totally embraced in it? 
totally embraced in it. In fact, I switched. I, I was. I, I bought my first computer in 1983. Okay. So if you remember computers, that was brand spanking new in yeah. 1983, and I bought one. I didn't know the first thing about it, and the first two ones I owned were little more than doorstops, <laughs> because I, you know, this was command line DOS. Yes. So you had to know the language in order to make, I mean, do anything. But gradually, and with the help of a, of a guy who was my assistant for a while, who desperately wanted to be a photographer and who was not a photographer and ultimately realized he wasn't a photographer and ended up becoming a major player at Microsoft. <laughs> not bad. No, he now owns his own consulting business and Microsoft is his biggest client. <laughs> <laughs> but he was my assistant at the time, and he would walk me. I would call him up and say, Rich, I don't know what I'm doing here. How do I get this done? And he would spend hours on the phone with me, walking me through computer stuff. So I gradually learned how to get through. And then, of course, Windows came out, and that helped. Yeah. Um, but comes 2000, and I'm getting heavily involved in digital, and Windows sucks. <laughs> I've got three computers sitting on my desk that I built myself and I, with the best parts that I could to, could get. At Fry's or wherever you were yeah, trying to buy stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And they would crash five, six times a day. I'd get the blue screen of death. Oh. And, you know, Windows, even Windows, I mean, it didn't matter which one. It was, they, they sucked. So I realized I got to do something. But I'm still, you know, how do I jump out of Windows? If I go to Mac, I'm, I've got to completely replace everything I have. Right. So I've decided to, to buy a laptop. I went to, Fr or not Fry's, to Micro Center to buy okay. a, a new laptop. And I figured I was going to get a Toshiba, but I was kind of looking at an IBM at the same time. That was before IBM sold out to Lenovo. Right. And I'm about... It, uh, 40 minutes or so with the salesman, and I said, well, I, I think the Toshiba is the way to go. And he says, you need a Mac. I said, a Mac? I said, we're not even talking Mac. I said, I can't buy a Mac. i got to replace all the software. i got all the peripherals that don't work with Windows, with Macs, and yada, 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 yada. Said, I don't care. You need a Mac. I ended up walking out of the place with a PowerBook 500, I forget all the... Yeah. Gibberish, but it was their latest and greatest. I said, you're going to get this back tomorrow. I took it home, and uh, I spent, and this is before OS X. OS X was out, but it was 10.0, and if you recall, 10.0 was terribly unstable. Mm -hmm. So OS 9 was still your operating system. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to break this thing. So I spent all day trying to break the computer, trying to get it to crash and I could not get it to crash. Meantime, my PCs, my Windows machines are crashing. Yeah, they're as blue I'm, with death back and yeah, forth. They're I'm just, not doing anything <laughs> they're crashing. You know? Son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> you look at it, it crashes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the next day I go back to the Micro Center and I not only keep that laptop, but I buy, I buy a desktop, uh, uh, the first of their dual processor desktops, the Dual 800. In less than like 18 hours, you were back and like, let's do this. Oh, yeah, I'm like totally... I'm totally Macintosh. <laughs> I'm buying peripherals. I'm buying software. Right. I'm buying hardware, whatever you need. Whatever it needs. I mean, I look like a, I, my house looked like an Apple store. <laughs> What'd you do with the PCs? I sh sh shit canned them. Yeah. See a trash can. Oh, God. Garbage. A awful, weren't they? And, and I was buying the best stuff. I thought top of the line hard drives, not that crap. Right. You buy a Dell, what do you get? Huh? Yeah. You get an average. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yeah. I'm going for the best I can get my hands on, and it's still crapping out constantly. And it's not the hardware that's failing. It's the software. It's, mm -hmm. it's Windows and DOS and whew, crazy. But I, I get OS 9 to start with, but that summer, OS 10.1 came out, and I got that free because if you remember back then, you had to pay for it. Yeah. They gave it to me free because part of buying that desktop, I got a free copy right. of 10.1. Right, a free CD. Yeah, right. Exactly. So when 10.1 came out, Apple sent it to me. And I loaded it, and I've been at Apple ever since. Right. There's no looking back. Night and day. Oh. Even now. Uh, I mean, there's lots of people who use Windows. Many of my clients are Windows-based. But 
even even some of those in the back room they got Macs. <laughs> right. Somebody's got a Mac in the back room, like exactly. a speakeasy. Then someone goes back there and does a little work on there it. There you go. What what do you still enjoy shooting today? What still fires you up? Someone calls and says, Paul, we got an assignment. What's that assignment that gets you lit? One of my clients is a uh, is a, a lab that does state of the art laser work. And that I I just when they call, I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Get all loosey goosey and let's do this. Oh yeah. Cause you know, lasers are difficult. Not only I mean you've got lasers that are visible, but you've got lasers that are invisible. They operate in an invisible light spectrum. Right. Human eye can't see it. So how do you make a photograph of that? That's challenging. Right. So you got to shoot something that you can't see the laser. So what do you do? You got to shoot what the laser is doing and figure out how to make that dramatic. And then there's laser surgery. That's a whole. I did a, a surgeon just before the COVID nineteen ended everything. Uh, I did a surgeon doing laser surgery, and I lit him with the laser pulses. How did you do that? It's timing, man. It's timing. Whoa. Now, what what made you think of that? Well, Did you see the process and kind of... Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I've, been, I've done so many assignments for this uh, group that, you know, I, I know what's going on. But what made me think of it was the impossibility of lighting it in some way that, I mean, if I light it, that's going to overpower the laser. So, yeah, right. You know, what I need is to be able to time those pulses so that I'm getting the pulse at a, at a point where it is also illuminating him. Right. And those pulses are very, very short. <laughs> right. Do you enjoy portrait work? I like portrait work that is, um, that's not really classic standard portrait. Okay. So uh, not, not Richard Avedon or something, but you like actually more creative? Well, yeah, I mean, Avedon was, Avedon could find ways to make simple portraits really, and, and Karsh, I mean. Right. Uh, they, they brought light into an, the image in ways that other people hadn't thought of. And that's, I, I, lo I, joy, I love making portraits, even standard portraits, um, that are lit in a, in a unique way. Right. Yeah, yeah, because what we are is manipulators of light. Exactly. That's. I mean, what we do is take light and fuck with it. Yeah, that's it. No, it's you're fine. Like that's that's what we do. Yeah. Shape it, move it, create it, put your subject slightly in it, and then bring more in or out. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Or a portion. You know, a portion yeah. slit. A portion isn't, and you're making a statement with that. I mean, it's there are all kinds of ways to attack portion. I I made a portrait of a swimmer. On, on the start. Yeah. In fact, you saw it coming out of the bathroom. Right. That's it. Like, that's that's some of the best stuff. Yeah. Is when you can take light and make something from it. Yeah. And manipulate it. Does that, has that always been something that just, like, for you, just really gets you going? Well. When you can do that? It's not very standard and flat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right from the get-go, I mean, literally from the first moment I picked up a camera, I realized that light was what this was all about. It wasn't about the camera. It wasn't about, you know, something, you know, lenses. Yeah, but the camera is basically a box with a shutter in it. That's, that's it. All. That's, that's it. That's all it is. I mean, it can be a computer with a box with a shutter in it, but, but it's still just a box with a shutter in it. It's nothing without light. Exactly. It's a doorstop. Right. No light, doorstop. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you got a $25,000 lens on it. It's doorstop if you don't have light. Right. Was there an assignment you wish you had that just somehow didn't pass, come past you in your career? <laughs> okay, this is kind of a left to, uh, left to right story. But yes, um, I, I never shot the Kentucky Derby. And that bummed me out um, because... I, there was one year when I was at Sports Illustrated that the Derby was coming up, and I really wanted a Derby assignment. Not the least of which, the Derby's a great party. You know, oh, you, we yeah. go there, you're, you're there from like Monday or Tuesday on, all those parties. The SI photographers get invited to them. Most photographers don't, but mm -hmm. the SI uh, shooters do. Uh, so it's a great time, and it's an opportunity for to shoot a great sporting event, and it's always a cover. Right. You know, 
And sure. I guess I, it's all about, you know, coverage. It's all about the coverage, right? <laughs> okay. So yeah, the Derby's coming up, and I'm having a hell of a year. And so I figure I'm going to get a Derby shot, uh, assignment, and I don't. I get sent to shoot <laughs> to shoot a semifinal game of the NBA championships between the Boston Celtics and the Philadelphia 76ers in Boston. It's a column story. Oh. I am not a happy camper. I am a very unhappy camper. Because it's a one, I live in Connecticut at the time, so and I'm only an hour, 15 hour, and 20 minutes from Boston. Uh, so, you know, it's not even a, it's a one day shoot. It's right. 300 bucks because a column story ain't going to get you any page rate either. No, nothing. So, I'm a ha an unhappy camper. I go, I shoot the game, but I mean, I shoot it as well as I can possibly shoot it. Right. We strobe it, so at least the light's good. The next day, I've got a corporate assignment in upstate New York, so I don't even go home. I drive directly to upstate New York, and it's like a honk, and I've, you're all the way across Massachusetts and all the way up the New York Thruway, like about six hours. About two o'clock in the morning, I pull over to one of the rest stops to get a cup of coffee, and I call Steve Fine, who's picture editor, on that story. Right. And I say, ah, oh, Steve, how does, so how'd it go? He says, well, you didn't have a bad night. You got the cover. I said, fuck you, Steve. I know the Derby got the cover. Give me a freaking break. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I still got two hours worth of driving in front of me. He says, Paul, you got a shot so awesome, you knocked the Derby off the cover. The basketball story went from column black and white to cover. Second lead. Derby's still the lead, but your story's second lead. He says, and you got all the pictures. The other, you, you skunked the other photographer. What was the photo of? <laughs> Mo Cheeks went for a layup, and Kevin McHale came across the key from the other side of the key and wrapped his hand around the top of the ball to block it. Now, McHale is about, I don't know, nine feet off the ground, maybe more. Mo is up like this, <laughs> and I got that fraction of a second. Just stuffing him. Was that a uh, Hasselblad back then? Or was that 35? That was a Hasselblad. That was a Hasselblad. Yeah. That's what the men shot. Yep. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty good. Hasselblad C, too. Not even a motorized yeah. version. Just C. Bang. <laughs> you got to crank it. <laughs> you know that? Waist level? Uh, no, no. I used, used a, a prism. I used a prism. Yeah. So the Kentucky Derby, we got to get you at the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, I would still like to shoot the Kentucky Derby. It's a beautiful event. That's I haven't gotten that one yet. Yeah, I've been there, but I haven't shot it, and that's totally different. Oh yeah, I mean the women are gorgeous, yes, and the hats the and the hats hairs. Are and everybody's got beautiful drinks. The guys are all dressed up. The event, the the steeple, the whole thing. It's just gorgeous. Yep, yep. God, I love I it. Still haven't shot it, and I'm. Did Still you enjoy to... horse racing? Uh, yeah, I, sh I actually shot quite a few horse racing assignments for the New York Times. Okay. Uh, in fact, I, I shot one for Steve Fine where they, they ran it all the way across the top of the page, about four columns deep with a black border around it. It was such a hot shot, and they had never done that before. Never bordered a picture in the magazine. The, in the wow. That's so rare. Oh, it was fine. Was like in twelfth heaven. He says, "Oh my God!" You, I, and he's trying to explain to me what they've done with it. He's, he was so excited he could barely talk. How, what would it fine me, mean to your career? Steve was a kid, really. When I met, he was right out of college. Um, he had scored this job at, at Sports Illustrated as a what they called a negative reader, as you right. probably remember. Um, and we just hit it off. Uh, and Steve would. If Steve thought I wasn't getting an assignment on a given week in the picture meeting, he would speak up. You know, what about Paul? Uh, so, fine. And then when he was with the Times, he got gave me regular work. Fed you all the time. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I always loved working with him. Steve was a great guy. Tough. I mean, he expected... <laughs> And I don't mind that. No, no, I, I don't mind it either. He, he expected you to go out there and, and just and kill yourself if you had to, to get the right. shot. Were there were there other guys that you worked with? I don't know if you worked with like Klutenheimer or with Walter, or any of the guys or Zimmerman who was back then that you enjoyed your time with them. Um, I I did a couple of assignments with Walter. Walt was a, Walter was a great guy. 
Yeah. Great guy. Um, the first time we worked together was the National League last week of the National League uh, regular season, Montreal versus Philadelphia in Montreal. Wow. Yeah. And it's a three-game set, and whoever wins two of those games wins the division. And it's me and, and Wally get assigned to it. And Wally calls me up the day before. I, I, live in, I lived in Willimantic, Connecticut at the time, and, and phone rings, and it's Wally. You know? <laughs> I just thought I'd give you a call and, and see if you, you, know, you had any questions, uh, you know, anything in, I might tip you on. And I said, geez, I don't know, Wally, you know, I'm, I'm going through my head. What could it be, you know, equipment I might need? <laughs> And, and I said, I can't think of anything. And he says, well, there's one piece of equipment you absolutely have to have. And I said, what is it? He says, your tennis racket. I got a, yes, I got a court tomorrow morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bring your racket. And bring your racket. Yep. That's it. Mm -hmm. I remember assisting him with the all said, bring a tennis racket. I was like. I thought there was a joke. Like, I'm thinking gaffer state, double-A batteries. I know, I'm going through all that stuff in my head, right. too. Like, it's what like, do I need? And they're like, bring a tennis racket. I'm like. We're going to be in Utah. Like, it's going to be finals. What the hell do I need a racket for? Because Wally will find a court. Yeah, he'll find a court. Yep. So crazy. Oh, crazy. Wally, who's been to, who shot the, the Olympics in Montreal, has shot who knows how many other events in Montreal. Wally has no sense of direction. We drive an hour and an out of the, going the wrong direction on the way to the, to the game. Because Wally's It's all right drive. there. I know. There's a subway is in the station goes under it. I'm not even contract yet. I'm still freelance and Wally's staff, what's he got to worry about? What? If he hasn't got a picture, <laughs> nobody's gonna take his job away from him. Yeah. I'm freelance. If I don't get a picture, I'm screwed. Yeah. Right? You're not we water. don't even get there until the third inning. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Wally doesn't shoot a frame. Why? Of course, Wally knows everybody. Of course. He knows the TV people, so they let him in the TV dugout. You know, the camera yeah. spot next to, yeah. between the dugout? They let him in there. Nobody else can go in there, no. but Wally gets in there, right? And I'm watching him. I'm in the photographer's dugout in the first base side, and I'm stuffed watching Wally. Stuffed in with everybody yeah, else. Stuffed in with everybody else. Tons of equipment. Wally brings in two cameras and two lenses. That's it. He brings in a 600 F4 and a 50. That's it. God bless him. I've got seven cameras, you know, 12 lenses. you got everything. i got everything I can carry on my body. And a body. tennis racket. And a tennis racket, <laughs> yes. And he probably nailed it. Of course he nailed it. It's Wally. They ran two photographs. One was the winning pitcher, and the other was a a, a, a celebration shot, which only Wally could get from where he was because Wally had the TV shot. Right. And of course, He's everybody's going to celebrate to the TV. So sure. Wally gets the shot. Wally got it. Being around him at that time, like, did you feel like you're around greatness? Like, as great as you're shooting, and you're making unbelievable images when you're around him, and that was peak at well, those times. Wally was, was in another realm. Yeah, wasn't that crazy? Oh, well, he, to this day, if you pick up the, the SI swimsuit issue, which is still well done, um, but it's now all fashion photographers right. shooting it. Yeah. Except Wally. He almost every year they bring Wally to the They still some bring him shoot. back, yeah. And you can, you flip open that magazine and you can pick out his images instantly. Yeah. They're so good. They're so much better than anybody else. I mean, they bring in Patrick de Marchillier. Yeah. Great photographer. O'Neill and Ma Ma Marino, they've, everybody gets a shot everybody, in there. They've yeah. brought him in there. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's coming. And, and they're all great photographers. And Wally blows them all away. Right. It's just, he's so good with his subjects. Yeah. Like he has an unbelievable way. It doesn't matter if it's Michael Jordan or Christy Brinkley, he can make them comfortable and put them at ease and make unbelievable photos. And then he makes light do things that nobody else seems to be able to do. Right. You know, he shot his first assignment for Sports Illustrated at 15. Yeah, 15. Can you imagine what was Paul doing at 15 at the same time? Like, what could you have done? <laughs> Nothing, right? Like, oh, no, I mean, I didn't even own a camera. Right. I was I trying to figure out how to buy beer. <laughs> exactly. That tells you where you were at. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever think, like, um, and look at stuff like, oh, maybe war photography or National Geographic early in your career. Like, that's that's maybe a, an area I want to dive into. 
I actually tried to get Time Magazine to send me the, to uh, one of the uh, wars in the Mideast. Um, but the, the picture editor at the time said, I'm not sending a guy with three young children to a war zone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's and that's another issue. A yeah. lot of those games, like guys, James Knockway, you know, yeah. you know, not married, no kids. You can't. He the images he makes, you have to have a, you know, a bird in the back of your head, a little, a little voice going. Oh, you got you got family. Well, you, yeah, you got a wife. Yeah, you got kids. Do you really want to go right there right now? That's tough. No, it is. Um, unfortunately, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't exactly respect my body. My wife used to know where I was in the world by the hospitals that came. Was it that way? Did you put yourself at risk or, or, or to get that photo? Constantly. What did you bust up? You got like that evil Knievel kind of like medical report? <laughs> I, I was shooting a whitewater rafting assignment and I took a whitewater raft over a waterfall. Okay, that's that's sometimes good and sometimes really bad with camera gear. Well, the the deal was we came to a part of the river that was unrunnable. So it's, you know, class six water or higher. And it's this waterfall and the water was running 21,000 cubic feet per second. So we're talking some serious water. Serious water. Wow. And I suggest to them that a great photograph would be the raft coming off that waterfall with the water behind the boatman in in moderate control and that cataract behind him they liked that thought and there were two guys who were like me uh, younger than I and they were both probably 20 maybe 21 at most um, and crazy and and so one of them a boatman said, yeah, I'll do it. And one of the bailers said, I'll do it. And so the three of us, we took all of the, sh the gear from the other rafts and we piled it up behind the boatman. So we'd had all that weight in the back Counterweight, of the boat. Counterweight, right. Exactly. So, right. So when you come over the falls, theoretically, that counterweight at the back would drop the raft flat. Right. Now, thinking of physics, that theoretically should work. Only I forgot one aspect of Newton's laws, which is a body in motion tends to stay in motion. <laughs> That's kind of a the big one. Yeah, it is kind of a big one. And, but it, I'm thinking in terms of one body. But that raft isn't really one body. It's a front traveling at one speed and a back traveling at another speed. Right. And that back, instead of flattening out because it's traveling at speed it's going that way it wants to keep going that way right its velocity is going in a different direction than exactly. the nose so instead of the raft flat, flatting flattening out as we went over the falls the raft pitched nose first into the water i was sitting in the front of the raft so i get pitched driven right to the bottom of the river and the vortex picks me up and sucks me back up against the wall of rock that creates the waterfall at 21,000 cubic feet per second water speed. There's no way you're coming out. That must have been one hell of a ride. They assumed I was dead. They just hoped that the body would pop out. Most bodies don't pop out until the fall when the water gets below. And what happened? Well, if you panic, you're dead. That's basic flat, no changes rule. If you panic, you're dead. So you can't panic. You got to think. Your natural thing is to try and push out through the water. Mm -hmm. You can't. Yeah, you're not, you're, yeah, you're not going to win that battle. No, you can't. There's no freaking way. So what you have to do is do exactly the opposite and press up against that wall as hard as you can because there's still water there. And you work along the still water until you find an eddy, a rock. And there's lots of rocks. If the rock's big enough, the eddy will suck you out. So you, you work along the wall until you find the eddy, and then you stick yourself in the eddy, and the eddy just shoots you up. Now, where did you learn this, you know, safety Well, maneuver? it's not something you learn. It's something you figure out <laughs> at the moment because <gasps> it's that or die. Right. Well, that's a good one. How was the photo? Um, the photo was good. We, it was Kodachrome, uh, and in order to preserve it, because it got wet, sure. you know, um, I had to fly it down to the Kodak lab in, uh, in Hollywood, and they, they were able to preserve 
21 frames off the roll. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, that's evil Knievel kind of numbers right there. I've had a good time. <laughs> you have. Would there be anything in your career you change? You would change, and, ch- and change it up and go like, you know, I wish I would have taken that corporate job and made it into like a staff job, or you know, you weren't happy with a period of time, four or five years. I would never have gone to a staff job. I don't work well uh, under supervision. Okay. Um, I. I, I like being my own guy. Uh, I, like, I like having the responsibility be mine. Mm-hmm. If I fail, that's my fault. Right. It's on you. It, it's all on me. And I like that. Yeah. So as far as wanting to work for someone else, no, never did that. Never wanted that at all. I, at times I have, cons- I have thought back and said, I mean, there was a point of time where I could have moved to New York City instead of California. Um, and maybe, especially when I was really hot, uh, that might have presented some opportunities. Because that does put you in the center of the universe at exactly. that point. Exactly, puts yeah. you in the center of the photographic universe big time. And from time to time, I think about the fact that I kind of stayed away from fashion, and there's a lot of money in fashion. A lot of money. And a lot of creativity, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, although you have to work for, with some very unusual people at times. But would, that would have given you an unbelievable creativity with oh, yeah. either strobes and lights and the visuals and that palette. Yeah, and that's the part that I go, would have liked to have played with that a little bit. Right. Especially in the early 80s. The oh, 80s. I know, because it was really big. Right. You know, I mean, was, you know, you got people like Ralph Lauren and Hustle, all those people. It, it just would have been an absolute fun time. And, you know, they're, they were paying photographers $25,000 a day. Yeah, a to, day. Yeah. Yeah, size so paying you 300 300 a day. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Ooh, make yeah. that one. Go photograph Dan Marino or go photograph beautiful women. Mm. Now, I, I will say that I had... The, the most money I ever made for a single day assignment was $27,000. Okay. So, you know, that's not bad. I'll right. take that. But you can make that for every day for two weeks at Fashion Week in New York. Right. So. Yeah. And then a couple I, months later, do it again. Yes. And they're putting you up in the, you know, the plaza mm-hmm. or Townsley Palace. And, right. You know, and you're, you're not paying for anything. Yeah. They're you're picking the Regis, up all the tabs. The Saint, you know, wherever. You're, yeah. you're, you're taken care of. Yeah, exactly. And it's New York, and you're eating like a king. All of the above. So that's the only... That's probably the only real... God, I wish I'd done that. Right. Uh, that's know. not a bad thing. No, and I mean, the money would have been nice simply because... I didn't. I was a freelance photographer when our second son was born, and he was so ill. Uh, so I had no insurance. So right. all that money came out of my pocket. Right. Which you know, that but, means that you're working because you got to pay a lot of bills. I mean, he would fall down on the playground, and we'd get a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar bill. Um, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, that makes it rough. How does a man from Connecticut love the cowboy? Because when you walked, when I saw you that first time, I thought you were from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or Billings, Montana. <laughs> I, I, it's a tough one to explain. I've just always been into it. I, I loved cowboy boots. I loved cowboy hats. I loved the whole th- idea of cowboys. You know? Right. I mean, I wore this shirt today just for this. <laughs> I noticed it, man. Yeah. We walked in the door. I'm yeah. chuckling because I have one just like it. I know it. you do. <laughs> Yours is probably dirtier, more well fit. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't normally you know, dress the part for my, uh, my guests, but I was like, I got to sport this today. Because you were just such a, like, if you, someone, I would have, if, so, if someone said, you know, his, his horse is out back. I'd have been like, damn right, it probably is. <laughs> Lots of people yeah, asked me. Big that ass too. horse named Cisco, and he's Where's got your horse. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought it was so cool, it was so absolutely, absolutely badass. I, and I wasn't even trying to be cool. It was just that's what I liked. Did you ever work with Peter Reed Miller? Yes, uh, we did. We worked on a couple of assignments together. There's a photo of Peter Reed Miller where he looks like he's with the Almond Brothers early yes. in his career. Yes, yes. He's got like shirt all done done and big feathered hair and leather pants and a big buckle and I was like you with the Alma Brothers you like one of the roadies like it's like the guy you guys were so cool back then 
It, it was cool by accident, really. Right. Um, but you guys were rock stars. How yeah, we kind of were, even though at the time I'm not sure we really saw ourselves as rock right. stars. Yeah. We just we were doing our job and we were doing our thing, and we were successful enough at it that we got a lot of slack. I mean, SI didn't try to tell us what to do. I mean, I'm sure they told some people what to do, I think, but, but really no one ever said to me, go shoot this. They might say, go shoot this person, mm -hmm. but not go shoot them this way. Right. Uh, it was entirely up to me to figure out, I mean, look at Gretzky. You know, right. Juggling the puck. You know, sure. It's told me to have Gretzky juggle a puck for the cover of the magazine, but what a shot it was. Right. Um, and that was, you know, I said, can you juggle the puck on your stick? He said, yeah. <laughs> he does it all the time. Like, they, you know. Yeah. The, then he goes to me, do you want the logo to face you or you want the logo to face away? I said, I want the logo to face <laughs> every shot. The logo was up front. <laughs> just right there. Yeah, I mean, that's the skill he had. Right. I mean, he's been doing it since he's, you know, before he can walk. Yeah. What's the best photo you ever took? Wow. Hm. If someone comes to you and says, Paul, make me a print. I want it for my house. Like, what's the one you give them? Well, certainly one of the ones in the running is the Gretzky six-shot multiple exposure. Uh, I mean, just the technical side of that alone is one that I uh, it's I like a lot because I solved a lot of problems to make that art, that image, and and it was the f literally the first multiple exposure image I ever made, Jesus. and I made it for Sports Illustrated. Yeah, of all people, you didn't even like give it a practice shot in the no, yard. Like, no. <laughs> talk about hanging them out. So. That one's that one would be uh, high on the list. Um, wow, next to that, um, huh. okay, um, it's a little odd. It's it's probably really odd. Well, before I started working for SI, I'm working for the AP, and. Bob Child, the staff photographer, was on vacation again. Or uh, no, he was on another shoot. He was the AP court, uh, New York had pulled him up on some other big shoot someplace. Okay. So I'm the only guy in town, and the FBI ar arrests one of the ten most wanted criminals in Bloomfield, Connecticut. They arrest him in a bank. He walks into a bank and he tries to cash a check, and the teller recognized him and calls the police and the FBI show up and, and, and arrest them. So now they've captured one of the 10 most wanted criminals in the country. That's big. Big. I get a call from the AP. Can you go to the federal courthouse in Hartford and see if you can get a picture? So the judge, federal judge, bars the media from the building. Usually they bar you from the courtroom floor for, certainly from the courtroom, but usually, oftentimes, they'll buy you from the, the floor. Mm -hmm. But they don't buy you from the building. This judge barred us from the building. So there's no way anybody's getting any pictures. Federal courthouse in, in Hartford has an underground garage. They brought them in the underground garage. They're going to take them out the underground garage. They're not going to perp walk. At least, we don't believe he's going to sure. perp walk. So, you know, what am I going to do? Everybody's standing around, got all these photographers from everybody you can think of. You know, is, think there. Of is there. Because it's one of the ten. That's big. Exactly. It's huge. You know, Time has got somebody there, all the newspapers, all the wire services, everybody's there. And I realized that if they do perp walk them, we're all going to get the same picture. Mm -hmm. I don't want the same picture everybody else has. So I kind of act like I'm not going to put up with this crap anymore and the courthouse is closed, the hell with this, I leave. And I walk off. Only all I do is walk around to the garage entrance because I know eventually if they don't perp walk them, if they perp walk them, I'm screwed, but I would have got, everybody's going to get the same shot mm -hmm. anyway. I'm going to take a risk. They're going to take them out through the garage. And I hang out it's hours, hours. And I hang out by the entrance to the garage. I've parked my car way away so it's not obvious that I'm there but I'm you know here's this guy out on the street the camera about four o'clock in the afternoon 
the elevator opens, I can see there's a door, you know, I can see through the door, that, the, the car door, that, that uh, you know, they walked this guy out the elevator and he's all cuffed up. So it's got to be him. They put him in a car. They see me out there. So they come screeching across the garage. They hit the ramp that comes up outside, <laughs> and I jump in front of the car. Right in front of it. Guy slams on the brake, hits me. <laughs> he couldn't avoid hitting me because I stand right in front of the car. But as, he, as the car gets to me, I turn and take the shot with my butt, fly up the hood, slam against the windshield, roll off the windshield. This Marshall, no air conditioning in federal cars at that time. So they've got the windows open. It's a summer day. It's hot as hell, especially in Hartford. Right. So his windows rolled down. I elbow his head out of the way, shove the camera in behind his head. This guy is sitting between two marshals. I click one frame and run like hell. <laughs> was the cover of every friggin' newspaper in the country. <laughs> oh, 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 that's unbelievable. They chased me all over Hartford. <laughs> I went through basements. I went, they didn't know who I was. Sure. They didn't know what agency I was with. They were just chasing me, you know, because they, they don't like getting beat. No, not at all. So, yeah, that was that would be high on my list. Is there one you wish you could have back? You missed bad film, ref's butt, a uh, card went bad. Well, again, it's a little odd. Um, Those are the ones, I mean. It's, it's not really a, sh it's not like something, what, what went bad was I'm landing at Washington National for a hockey game at um, the Capitol Center mm -hmm. that night. And the Air Florida plane crashes right in front of us. We're on final approach and the Air Florida plane crashes. And we're literally... Uh, wheels are maybe 100 feet off the runway, off the deck, and they close the airport. And this pilot guns it, and up we go. Now, it's snowing, which is why the Air Florida crashed. We can't land anywhere, because Washington's closed. Dulles is closed. Was uh, I'm on a United flight. United doesn't have gate space at Baltimore. They fly us back to first Boston. Boston's closed. Providence is closed. Hartford's closed. We finally land in Philadelphia. But Jeez. by that time, assignment's gone. Yeah. And there's no way for me to get, even if there were time, relatively speaking, there was no way for me to get from Philadelphia to Washington, to the Washington Capitol Center in time for the game. I right. Mean, snowing. I couldn't get a rental car anyway. Every rental car in the, in the airport was gone. And Barbara was livid at me because I had missed the assignment. Never mind that the Air Florida plane had crashed right, had crashed right, right underneath you. And a snowstorm that paralyzed the entire East Coast was going on. Barbara was livid at me because I had missed the assignment. Yeah. Uh, another Capitals game. Yeah. Good Lord. Yeah. If you weren't a photographer, what would you have done? You know, if you just... If you if it never worked out, <sighs> well, I wouldn't have been a politician. I, you know, I said kind of had right. that in mind. But yeah, because you were thinking politics, right? Yeah, but I kind of realized that politicians were mostly thieves and crooks and 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 liars, and that didn't seem like a real good career aspiration. <laughs> yeah, it's not the waters you wanted to swim in. <laughs> you know, you look at politicians today and. I, I, it, was it a mistake to think that way? Maybe, but I don't think so. Um, I don't. I, I don't see myself as a politician. I'm. I'm not real good at compromise, and I'm not real good at glad handing, and I'm really bad at asking people for money. So. Um, then yeah, that you're out. Yeah, I'm out. Um, I probably would have been a writer. Um, writing was something I was really good at. Um, you enjoyed it. I loved writing. I graduated from college not because I was a good student. I graduated from college because I changed my major and became an English major. Uh, I was I, I was on the vert, not a flunking out, but I wasn't doing well because I really wasn't into what I was majoring in. And I I put off 
a freshman English class until my junior year. And my, my counselor um, finally said to me, you're going to take this class or I'm not signing your card. <laughs> so I took the class and the professor was a 60 plus grade haired old man glasses, really. I mean, I walked into that class and I thought, oh God, I don't want to do this. And I was thinking about how I could drop it and you know, find some other section to be in or something. By the end of that hour, I loved this guy. <laughs> really? And I was like, I, I've got to have more of this. And I started, I dropped two other classes and picked up English classes and changed my major to English. And that's why I graduated from college. Wow. What did he do that just that he had a way flipped of, a switch? He had a way of presenting things that was just different, and you saw uh, things that I, I could read and, and take literally and not be excited about. He opened a, a pathway to see them in a non-literal way that made you think completely different thoughts about what you were reading. Right. That, and that's that's what you want. Yeah, that's what you want professors to do. Mm -hmm. You know, not everybody works the same way. So if he can find a way around that sparks something in young Paul. That's the best thing you can have. When he died, and he died uh, in the eighties before we moved out here, but it was like eighty one or eighty two, something like that. Um, I went to his funeral, uh, and I don't go to funerals, <laughs> but I went to his funeral. That's special. That is really special. You know, he was, he changed my life. Wow. Now, when I walked in and, and you've showed me a bunch of the work and I, and I see it, painting, let's talk about it. It's, <laughs> some, it's something, right, that, you know, you, you've actually picked up and you're doing, you know, and you're enjoying it. I love it. Yeah. You said Jackson Pollock was a huge inspiration. and I, I, It's ironic. When, when I was a kid, I saw Jackson Pollock painting, and I was like, whoa, that is so cool. Because it, was, it, it wasn't a portrait. It wasn't, you know, a Dutch right. master. It was this explosion of, of creativity and, and mind meld and I was just so taken with it I went wow yeah it wasn't in the lines how you used to draw in your coloring yeah, book not at all it was nothing it was, was in the lines rules. it was all, no rules clearly no rules so did mom and dad take you to a museum or how did you see it no I saw it in a, in a, a magazine oh in a magazine okay yeah, yeah. And then you were like, what the hell? Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, I thought it was just, and of course, then I found out about him, you know, alcoholic, kills himself on a highway, kills somebody else right. too. Um, but that whole school of, uh, of painting it just captured my imagination because it was outside. My parents spent decades trying to figure out where the hell I came from. <laughs> you think there was a mix up at the hospital? Except for the fact that I am the, the twin of my father, yes, because my parents were conservative Republicans. My mother was a farmer's daughter. My father was the son of a corporate executive. You know, they were they were brought up in Republican households. They were that kind of conservative. They they thought between the lines. They painted between the lines. They did everything between the lines right. by the rules. By I was never. <laughs> I, I was outside the lines from the word go. <laughs> Just exploded. When we went to Africa for that year, I thought I died and went to heaven because my father was so busy. He was working for the State Department. Yeah, I was going to say, how, how do you get to Africa as a young boy? My father was working for the State Department and on a, a year-long deal, a little more than a year. And originally, he was going to go and spend a year in Africa and make a bunch of money and... and and come home and get a new job uh, at some other university. But he got to Africa and realized that the opportunity for us to expand our horizons was too great to pass up. So he brought us all over. He spent the first 
two and a half or three months that he was in Africa in Ethiopia, which was no place for us to be. And Ethiopia at that time was really bad. Haile Selassie was the, uh, the dictator. My dad's hotel was outside the city gates, the old wall city gates. Okay. And every morning when he drove to work, there would be someone hanging from the city gates, oh. often more than one person. Well, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So that was not a place. So he waited until he went to Mozambique and brought us to join him in Mozambique. How young were the girls at the time? Uh, my sister Sherry was 12, my sister Maureen was 10, and my sister Jane was 6. Wow. That must have been unbelievable for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being a 14-year-old boy is one thing, but young girls in Africa, you know, and just the, the, the way that country was at that time. Well... My father's name was Robert Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy was the Attorney General of the United States. When Are you kidding me? We left for Mozambique the week after, or eight days or nine days after Jack Kennedy was elected president. So now Bobby Kennedy is the Attorney General right, designate. We board a flight at what was then called um, Idlewild Airport. As before it was renamed Kennedy Airport. Right. And we fly to London. And we're got, we got a connecting flight in, in London. We, we land at Heathrow, but we've got a connector from Gatwick. And we've got to go from Gatwick to Milan, Milan to Athens, Athens to Nairobi, Nairobi to Joburg. <laughs> So we land in London, and when we, State Department guy sees us off in New York, and he tells us that they're going to have someone meet us in London because we have a very tight connection between Heathrow and Gatwick, and they want to make sure we make the connection. So he's going to have someone from the State Department meet us and walk us through and make sure we, we make the Gatwick connection. So we land in London, and, and of course, there's no jetways then. You come down right, the stairs. Down the steps, onto the on tarmac. Our tarmac. So we land at the bottom of the steps, and this very proper British gentleman comes forward and says, are you the Kennedy family? Yes, we are. Follow me, please. So we follow him. We get to customs, and our bags, and we have, we're going to be in Africa for a year, so we've got like 17 bags or something ridiculous right. like that. And they're there. They're on a cart, and there's a sky cap pushing the cart, and the custom guys go, bam, 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 on the line. No questions asked. No just questions, banged them just out. Best to bang the passports and visas and off, you know, off the, we go down this long corridor and he opens the door with a somewhat something of a flourish and there's about 200 reporters and television cameras and photographers waiting for us because they think we're Bobby Kennedy's family. <laughs> Bobby Kennedy is the attorney general designate and at that moment he's in West Africa on a brief stop for some reason, who knows right. why he was there, but he was in West Africa. The stewardess on the BOAC flight sees Mrs. Robert Kennedy and family. Our destination is Africa. She puts two and two together and comes up with five and tells the pilot that Bobby Kennedy's family is on the plane and he needs the radio ahead to, to, to London to let him know we're coming. Wow, she missed that one. Big time. So, you guys are celebrities. With we're celebrities. And, of course, they're firing questions at my mother. Uh, of course, we, we get in the door, and, and, and my mother says, who do you think we are? And he says, well, you're the Kennedy family. <laughs> and, I, and me, big mouth, right? Yeah, but we're not that Kennedy family. <laughs> and and at, at that point, they realize they've made a mistake. But the media thinks it's a great story. So they want to talk to my mother. You know, how, does, how did this happen? Does your, does your husband know Bobby Kennedy? No, and we're not any relation. And somebody says to her, Mrs. Kennedy, did you vote for the president-elect? Here's my dyed-in-the-wool Republican mother. And she replied very diplomatically, no, I didn't, but I'm sure he'll make a fine president. Wonderful. At that point, the Rolls-Royce limo pulls in, loads us up, drives us to Gatwick, where we, they have held the plane on the runway for us. They literally drive this Rolls right up to the, it was a Caravel, which has the drop-down rear entry uh -huh. door. They literally drive it right up to the back of this Caravel, drop down the, the door. We 
climb on board, everybody looking at us wondering who the hell these yeah, people who are. are. These people. Right. They hold the plane for us. Um, Got to load all your bags. Load all our bags, etc. Off we go. Takes about, remember, this is 1960. It takes actually 61 by the time we start getting clippings. People from the States start sending us clippings from the next day. We were John Daly's six o'clock news lead story. Uh, we were on the, the yeah, basically the front page of half the newspapers in the country. Kennedy family gets red carpet welcome in London. <laughs> My mother's quote, right? Mrs. Kennedy, did you vote for the president-elect? No, I didn't, but I'm sure he'll make a fine president. I certainly did not. I'm a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, that's how they... Oh, Jesus! My, we start to get these clippings, and my father was like, okay, I guess my job's over. <laughs> yeah, this isn't going to last long. But it, it did. It, it, it was actually, it was a phenomenal year, both for my father and us, but it was particularly good for me because I got freedom to go and do. I was going everywhere. <laughs> I, we, were in, we were in Lorenzo Marx. And Lorenzo Marx is one of the best ports. It's the best deep water port on East Africa, on the whole side of that side of it. He said, even beats Mombasa. And so a lot of American ships come in. There's a lot of oil in and out of there. My father, big time smoker, Chesterfield Kings, up in Addis Ababa, they've got a PX. He can buy Chesterfield Kings over the counter, no problem. He figures, no problem, they'll have them in Mozambique, it's a better place to be. Uh -uh. All they got is a, a, a commissary, in, in, uh, uh, and it's just a consulate, it's not a, 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 it's not a full, uh, what do you call it, uh, embassy. Embassy, right, yeah. So, no, no PX. So my dad can't get his cherished Chesterfield Kings. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm, we're in a hotel on top of a hill, and I can see the harbor. And one morning, I'm, we're at breakfast because the restaurant's on the top floor of the hotel. And I see there's five American ships at, at, on the docks. So I high out as soon as I can after breakfast, go down to the ports. Of course, you can't get into the ports. It's all custom controlled and everything. Eh, I figured out. I found a way. And I snuck in. And I got aboard all five ships, and everybody gave me cigarettes. But my, my father had, a, at that point, hard and fast rule, you will be on time for lunch. So he didn't care what I did all morning, just as long as I was on time for lunch. I'm way late for lunch. <laughs> way late. And I figured originally I was going to leave the cigarettes on my dad's bed, so when we came back from lunch, you know, he'd walk in and there'd be the cigarettes. Eh, I better think twice about that. I better bring him with me. I need right. a you shield. Need, yeah, you need right. collateral to get yourself out <laughs> exactly. of this one. Because I'm in deep doo-doo. And sure enough, I, I'm walking across the... And I can see my dad is just staring me down here. <laughs> I know I'm in for it. And I get about halfway across the room. I've got my hands behind my back. And I pull them out. And they're loaded with Chesterfield Kings. <laughs> What's his expression? Where did you find those, Shocking. boy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like... Where did you get those? I said, you know, all those American ships? I got into the port and conned them out of, uh, out of guys on the ships that had them. Because, of course, they closed the lockers out three miles out, or 12 miles out, actually. But um, people would buy in advance. So, sure. you know, oh, there's this kid on board who's looking for Chesterfield Kings for his dad. Anybody got any? Everybody who did brought some up. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. What what advice do you have for young photographers today? What could you words of wisdom can you part them? I said it earlier, not too long ago. The client doesn't pay you for an excuse. The client pays you for a picture, and not a picture, the picture. Your goal every time you go out the door on an assignment has got to be to get the shot, and not. I mean, it's got to be special. You, you should want to come back from every assignment with an image that's so good, you have a hard time keeping it out of your portfolio. And if you do that, you're going to get work. You're going to work over and over and over again because people will start to rely on the fact that you get the picture, you get the job done. What does any employer want from any employee? A good job. Right. So... You're not the employer, but your client is relying on you to do a good job for them. Do it. That's do it. a good job. Yeah. Do your job. 
Your job is to get the picture. Do your job. That's all they want. Yeah. Yeah. You I mean, do that, and, and you're going to be just fine. So, I mean, to carve at it down. At least strive for it. Yeah. To carve it down to the lowest common denominator. Do your job. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. I can't thank you enough. I'm glad we got to meet early in my career. I'm glad that you made those pictures that I got to hang on my wall that inspired me. You know, I, I'm glad you showed up badass with that hat and boots <laughs> and that horse outside. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's. I'm glad you remember. Oh, please, yes. Like, it, it, like it's those things I have in my DNA where I saw like you and, and you tried to emulate. And so I tried to emulate those multiple exposures, those portraits, those hockey photos, you know, it's a sailing, all of them, because you're trying to use those great photographers and creatives as a springboard. If you can match yourself up with them and that's what I was always been doing. And you're one of those people that I tried to, to create those images that you were making. And I can't thank you enough for doing that. Well, one month from today, I'll be 75 years old, and I'm glad that I can say I had that effect on somebody. And, and it, I hope it was more than just you, but I'm really glad that it was on you. Yeah, because... Uh, and, and thank you for telling me that, because that that alone makes everything worthwhile. All those times in the hospital and busting yourself up with it. You know what? I don't care about all that stuff. <laughs> that heals. <laughs> that heals. Paul, you're the best. Thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. And to do this. You know, thank you for making all those great photos. Thank you for having me uh, do this with you. I mean, I'm, I'm honored that you chose me. Thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you for listening to my conversation with Paul Kennedy. Please click the like button if you enjoyed the episode. Subscribe as well. And remember, you can find all of our shows on the website, justagoodconversation.com. Thank you for listening.